Good morning. My name is Ricardo Lafore. Today is August 9th, 2010. I'm in Denver, Colorado at Servicios de la Raza interviewing Mr. Ernie Torres for the Voces Oral History Project. Thank you, Mr. Torres, for agreeing to uh, be interviewed by our project. Please know that if there are any topics you wish to discuss, you will not have to discuss them. Also, if there is something you wish to discuss, we want to hear you. If at any point you wish to stop the camera, to get a drink, or to use the facilities, please let me know. As we said earlier, your interview will be housed at the Nettie Lee Benson Library at the University of Texas at Austin campus. So, let's begin. <clears throat> Why don't we start by telling me a little bit about your childhood. What was your, what was your daily life like? Yeah. I guess it's normal, I guess, <laughs> for the family. Um, you know, we started out, uh, I guess, if we go back when I was small. Uh, I remember we used to live in a, a two or three room house down in Morrison, Colorado. Uh, and then uh, my dad worked the fields there, and then uh, he got a job at the Gates Rubber Company. And uh, we moved to Denver. Uh, we lived off of First and uh, uh, about Perry had a house there and you know, all the cousins would come over and that and then uh, and then shortly after that my grandmother moved and I think I think they lived in the San Luis Valley and they came to Denver. Um, I remember they lived over off of Wadsworth and uh, Jewel used to be a farmhouse there. Uh, I, I think it was a normal childhood from I can remember. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have uh, three brothers and one sister. I'm the oldest, and then my sister, and three brothers after that. What what kind of things did uh, you and your uh, siblings do together? Remember playing as a as a kid? What what kind yeah. of things you did? Well, I remember when we lived in the farmhouse there, and uh, there in uh, Morrison. You know, we, once we moved to um, from the little two or three bedroom or uh, two two or three room house to a bigger house. I remember it had a great big front porch, uh, a lot of shade trees. Uh, my dad used to work the fields. I remember we used to yeah, play out in the yard and uh, used to help my dad with uh, tractors and uh, I remember he used to bale hay, things like that. And I remember, you know, chasing my brothers and sisters around the house and we used to get on the roof of the patio. And now when you say Morrison, are you talking about the little town west of Denver? Yeah, and we were, we were probably, we lived right off of, uh, about Estes and Morrison Road there, that's where we lived. You said uh, you said uh, your dad was a was a farm worker. Yeah, he worked on the farm there. There was a, a gentleman there by the name of Desrick that owned the farm there, and they uh, I don't know if he did or the family owned Desrick's uh, furniture. It used to be down on uh, about uh, Second and Broadway, and uh, I believe it was Desrick's mother that worked at Gates Rubber Company, and she got my dad a job there. Uh, where were they born, your mom and dad? My dad was born in uh, Capulín, Colorado, and my mom in Manassa. What what memories do you have of uh, of your parents? Is there anything that kind of stands out? Mm. Yeah, they seemed uh, uh, you know supportive of what we did. Uh, uh, I remember uh, it wasn't until I was a little older, but my dad. Uh, my dad wasn't um, didn't have a lot of education. I later found out that he only went to the third grade. My mom went to the eighth grade, uh, and I remember when I first started uh, kindergarten or first grade. I think I didn't even think that kindergarten been first grade. Uh, we didn't speak English. We spoke Spanish at home, so we we had to learn English. And I remember we're going to. Um, oh, um, Catechism classes and stuff like that. I remember uh, my sister. We must, we must only been first or second grade. And I remember my my sister in the classes. She was crying, so they had to come and get me out of my my class to go sit with my sister because she would cry. Um, but I remember that uh, my mom was always telling us that we had to learn English and that if we wanted to uh, to get ahead, we had we had to speak English. Well, learn, write it, 
and all that. Cause I remember my mom saying that it was a, it was a white man's world. So we had to, to learn to live in that. And they, you know, even though we spoke Spanish at home, they always encouraged us to speak English. So you kind of understood from a, from a very early age that uh, it was, as you said, a, a white man's world and, and uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty clear, I guess, uh, to you that uh, things weren't, weren't equal. That, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Growing up, did, you, did your uh, uh, parents, your mom or, or dad, uh, have any traditions that, uh, that they maintained while they were, while they were growing up? Uh, I don't know so much of the traditions. Uh, uh, you know, I'd, you know, we used to get together with family for the holidays, and uh, uh, you know, we always. I mean, we didn't know any different then. It was always, you know, beans and tortillas and chili, and uh, it was special on Sundays. Mom used to make uh, fried chicken and uh, meatloaf, you know, uh, things like that. Uh, you know, I don't remember them making. Uh, taking the time to make tamales and all that, but it was a tradition every year, uh, you know, they go get chili, you know, and I remember them roasting the chili in, in the ovens. I remember the whole house smelled like chili for days, and, and I still I still remember that, you know. And then we go to the stands now, I know they're already roasted, but it takes me back to those days. I remember uh, their hands would get all burned, just call them enchiladas, the, the fingertips, because they're always peeling the chili, and, they used to get like eight or ten bushels, and I remember my mom would be soaking her hands in the cold water because of all the the chili. <laughs> I remember that, and then I remember uh, used to listen to Paco Sanchez, and I I remember in the, it must have been it must have been in the fall, I guess. My mom would make beans used to print the pressure cooker, and because of the humidity, the windows would be all fogged up. I mean, every time I see fog, the windows fogged up like that, it kind of reminds me of when mom used to make the beans, and, you know, and have the the, the pressure cooker, the little thing was always rattling. You can always hear that all over the house. For those who might not know uh, who Paco Sanchez is, why don't you tell us who? Well, Paco Sanchez, were, when I knew back then, I just knew him from the radio. But I, and later on, I knew that he started the GAO, the, I think it stood for the Good Americans Organization. Uh, he had a dance hall and uh, had a radio station and he helped the uh, the Hispanics in, in the Denver area and he was uh, he was a popular man. Uh, a I pioneer. Remember. Yeah, yeah, at that time. Mm -hmm. Did your family have to struggle economically? Uh, you know, at the time I probably thought we did because <laughs> we didn't have everything else the other kids had. But, you know, once my dad started working at uh, Gates, uh, and then uh, we had more uncles and uh, cousins used to work there. So, I mean, we went on vacations, you know, uh, my dad was able to, to buy a house uh, over in southwest Denver. Uh, we had a big yard. Uh, we probably had one of the nicer houses of the family. Uh, but it was, uh, there was some, some Chicanos that lived in the area. I mean, not a, it wasn't a... A white area, I guess you would say. Uh, you know, and my my family, they were able to afford, you know, uh, clothes. You know, we went to school. You know, they always go buy us clothes. So I didn't feel that we were poor or anything like that. I felt that we were probably middle class. Did any of your uh, family uh, members participate in uh, World War II or Korea? You know, at that time, um, my dad never went to the service, and. I didn't know about my other uh, family. I guess they they didn't. I don't think my grandpa was in World War One. I. I think he was uh, too young. I think at the time. So I remember he was born in 1900. So World War Two started. So he was, no, was probably 40. He was in the 40s. So he probably didn't go. And they, and they they lived in the valley. So uh, they probably didn't. He I don't know. At 40, I'm sure he, he was too old to go. And my dad never went to the service. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, and then I knew my uncle, my uncle Bill, we used to call him Uncle Willie. Uh, we knew he was in, he was a career serviceman, and my uncle Manuel, I know, was in the Navy. And these would talk a little bit about it, but um, I didn't know a whole bunch about it. And my uncle Manuel, I remember him talking, being 
on a ship and he was talking about he could hear explosions and the uh, uh, the cannons firing but I, I thought he was on a destroyer but later on I found out that he was on a, uh, um, a resupply ship an oil resupply ship and he was in the Korean War but I, I didn't know that till after he died we never we never spoke about it and when I came back from Vietnam uh, we never, we never really talked too much about that stuff. They never, they never asked me, and I never asked them. How old were you when your, when your parents died? Uh, they're still alive. Both, both my mom and dad are still alive. Mm -hmm. Do you think your attitudes about the country are different from those of your parents? Mm, I don't think so. Do you think the expectations and opportunities are different for you uh, than they were for your parents? Well, I think we have a lot more opportunity. You know, my mom, even though, uh, you know, they used to tell us that they, they wanted us to do better than they did. Uh, and my mom and dad didn't have, uh, didn't even have high school. So they always pushed that we should, uh, you know, go to school, you know, do the best we can. Um, they didn't put so much for college, but they, they pushed, you know, to to get through high school and to, you know, to do the best we could with, the, with our grades. And it got to the point as we got, we got into high school, they couldn't help us with the homework anymore because it was, it was beyond them. So it was, it was kind of up to us to <laughs> find our way. Do you think that's maybe uh, something that most uh, parents who don't have a lot of education, even in today, uh, today's uh, society, maybe not be able to help their children with their homework because of their limited education or English speaking ability? Um, yeah, I think up to a, to a point, uh, you know, now that I see my grandkids growing up, um, I have one daughter who, who did graduate but didn't, didn't go to college. She started uh, family early. Uh, but she she pushes to learn what what uh, what's going on in the school and even though uh, the older boys, they uh, have two of them. They're gifted. Uh, they're uh, one of them's already taken college classes. He's a junior, uh, but she she does her best to learn what what he's trying to do. And and uh, like he's in the calculus now, and she can't help him with that. But uh, she finds the schools, you know, the other other sources. My daughter, my other daughter, who's college educated, to, to get involved with that. So she makes sure that they. You know, they get the resources that they need. Uh, I think back then, with my parents, uh, they didn't know where to go with that. I mean, they kind of relied on us to uh, to kind of find it after that. Because they, they didn't, you know, they used to buy us encyclopedias and all that kind of stuff, you know, to try and help us. But it's not like today where you have the internet and uh, everything else. What languages did you or do you do you speak? Besides English, no, I speak some Spanish, but not fluent at all. We kind of, kind of lost that. We used to speak it mostly with my grandmother. My grandma spoke English, but she preferred Spanish. My grandfather, uh, he spoke uh, good English, uh, and my grandfather. Usually, my grandpa, we we spoke uh, English with him, but grandma, we spoke Spanish. But once, once they both died. Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't practice the language because my mom and dad they didn't they didn't speak Spanish with us at home you know the uncles would come over and aunts and come and stuff and it was all Spanglish you know half English half Spanish and that's what we learned it's uh it's it's interesting because uh, you say that uh, that your parents uh, spoke Spanish but they really encouraged you to speak English do you think that that's something that probably a lot of parents of your generation went through because they wanted, not because they didn't want you to speak Spanish, but because they wanted you to assimilate or to, or to be able to compete on an equal level with, uh, with Anglos and, and English speakers. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of it. And I think um, they, because uh, uh, there was prejudice in that. And I, I remember my mom talking that even as they were going to school, uh, even though he was he was there in the San Luis Valley, who was a lot of Hispanic, but it was it was white Anglo teachers, and they didn't allow them to speak Spanish at school. They were pushing them to speak English, so there was some discrimination. And I think my mom and dad uh, were trying to shield us. I think from the discrimination, 
and to teach us to speak uh, good English. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know, I hope that helped out some, but you know, there was some, some prejudice that, that we sure. saw, uh, but not, not to the point where they were, where they wouldn't, you know, sometimes you couldn't go to restaurants and things like that. Uh, I, I don't know about jobs and things like that. I, I, didn't, I didn't notice some discrimination until later on, and, and maybe at the time, because I hadn't had it a lot in my life, I didn't know what, that's what it was. What 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 were some of the things that you that you experienced when you did finally realize, hey, there really is discrimination? Yeah. Well, I remember we had a, we had some neighbors, uh, even though we we were friends, and there was an older um, guy that was there. He was probably two or three years older. Well, I remember these they used to walk down through the through the street, and they used to call them spicks, and you know, never never dirty mix and stuff like that, but mo mostly spicks. And I didn't understand what that was before, because my mom. Raises as a Spaniard, not not Mexican. We it was Spanish. We call she called the Spanish Americans. Uh, but we got some of that from there. And then once we got into high school and stuff, he had a more of a uh, more of a knowledge of that. Then I, I noticed that there weren't as many Hispanics that were there. You know, we went to Lincoln. Uh, and it was uh, mostly mostly white, mm -hmm. uh, very little black. Lincoln High School in Denver. Yeah, Lincoln High School in Denver. Mm -hmm. What what year was what, about what time was that? Mm, well, I graduated in '68, so I, I was uh, started there in '66. Uh, I mean, we had uh, split sessions because the, the school was so crowded. That was the year that uh, John F. Kennedy was built, so we had uh, uh, split sessions for half a year till they opened up Kennedy. Were there any any other things that during that time that kind of made you? Aware of your of your Hispanic culture and the fact that uh, you yeah, were well, not. well, I remember that you know that's when uh, Corky Gonzalez was coming on the scene, uh, demonstrations at West High School and stuff like that. So I was aware of some of that stuff was going on. Uh, my dad, uh, uh, they would talk about it somewhere. You know, we weren't as close on my dad's side as we were my mom's, but I remember my dad didn't like. Um, uh, Mexicans or, or wetbacks, as called them, house. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have a lot of contact with uh, m uh, more of the Mexican race. It was more the, of the, the family and the, ch the Chicano, I guess. Well, it's uh, it's been it's been uh, suggested that uh, the whole notion, particularly in the in the San Luis Valley and other uh, parts of rural Colorado, that the Spanish, the term Spanish was preferred because it was it was more, more uh, European, uh -huh. as opposed to Mexican, which which wasn't, you know, eventually. And I think I think that may also uh, uh, account for the fact that uh, uh, it, it it follows the same logic that people try and get you to speak English to shield you from discrimination. Or to make things better for you than it was mm -hmm. than it was for them, and I do you think that that, that distinction between Mexican and, and Spanish is is follows that same line of thinking? There? Yeah, and I think so. And uh, as I get into more of the genealogy and stuff in, in my side of the family, uh, we don't find any links to Mexico at all. Uh, there's a big gap <laughs> uh, between the. Uh, the 1400s and the 1700s that we don't know. Uh, you know, my brother's been doing some research. He can trace uh, family down to before there was New Mexico and Colorado in the early 1700s. Uh, but we find no traces in New Mexico or, the, or Spain. Uh, we're just going by the last name that the that Spaniard. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're hoping to find some more. My brother did do some DNA on himself and uh, found that it was European, uh, what, what DNA that they found. We thought we were going to find some Indian. Because my grandfather, my dad's side, mentioned that uh, it was either his his grandmother, great grandmother, was supposedly Indian, but in my brother's DNA there was no no trace of Indian blood at all. How far is uh, Capulín from uh, from the New Mexico border? Hmm. Thirty miles, maybe twenty miles. So, 
it's 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 uh, safe to assume that uh, northern New Mexico and southern Colorado were pretty much the same the same yeah. region. They didn't really know, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of an invisible border there that mm -hmm. maybe you know you uh, you didn't really think about. Uh, I I I I think from history and uh, what I what I understand is that at one time that whole parse parcel of land was one big land grant uh, and uh, and. Uh, and so, you know, it wasn't until later that you know statehood and all that sort of thing started drawing some mm -hmm. some some borders and some state lines. But uh, for a lot of people, you know, northern New Mexico and, Co and southern Colorado are, yeah. are one and the same. One and the same, yeah. Especially right there in San Luis Valley, San Luis, uh, Garcia, and Amalia, uh, all those towns right there. Uh, same with uh, Antonito, right, right on the border. You know, you just. From Montanito, you just throw a rock over to Mexico. You know? <laughs> so, you're growing up. You know your your early years, your formative years, uh, school, and uh, uh, is there is there anything you could you want to wrap up about? Maybe give us a statement about about that particular time of your life. Say, age uh, from birth to seventeen. Is there anything that you want to summarize? I think, you know, you know, I look back, you know, it was a good life, you know, my mom and dad did the best they could. Uh, at the time, you know, we considered ourselves uh, middle income. You know. uh, and I think my parents did the best they could with, uh, with the knowledge that they had. And uh, I have no, no complaints. <laughs> I think they did the best they could. <laughs> Tell me uh, about your school years. Uh, where where did you go to school? What were your first years in school? What uh, what school and what was well, it the, like? The, the first years was we lived there in uh, outside of the outskirts of Denver, Morrison. Uh, I went to uh, Bear Creek Elementary. That was my first uh, years I remember at school. I think I was probably first or second grade, and then my parents moved to Denver, and then I went to Perry. It was right on the corner of Perry and, and First Avenue. We went there for, well, probably to about the third or fourth grade, I think, and then my dad bought a house over in southwest Denver, and I went to Knapp Elementary. So we went there, and then I went to Kepner, and then there for, went to Lincoln after that. What was what was school like? Uh, well, uneventful, I guess. I mean, you know, when we were younger, we didn't, didn't know too much different. I mean, the you know, there was... The neighborhood was uh, quite a few Hispanics, you know. Uh, I don't remember any any black in the neighborhood. Uh, it wasn't until I got to uh, Kepner that there was some. And, you know, there was a lot of Hispanic students there, so I really didn't see any uh, difference. Uh, and then until I got to high school, then there was, we went to Lincoln, it was probably white. And then, and I, did, I personally didn't have any uh, Issues with that. Some of the other uh, more um, rowdy, I guess. <laughs> you know, I was kind of middle of the road kind of person. You know, my mom always taught us to try and get along with everybody. But there was some, you know, they used to get fights and those kind of stuff. And I, you know, I tried to stay out of that. I didn't don't remember getting in any fights and things like that. But I used to hang around with some of my cousins and they, they used to fight all the time. But. Uh, Were you a good student? Well, you know, at the time I thought I was, you know, <laughs> but when I got my got my grades, you know, some classes I did well, others I think I was average. Um, There's some classes I liked, uh, other ones, you know, didn't do so well, but that was average. So, so you were a C student? Yeah, C's, B's, you know, I got some A's, uh, D's once in a while here and there, and didn't do my homework. But I think I was average. What did you uh, participate in any of the uh, extracurricular school activities? No, and, and I, I regret that now. I didn't get involved in that, uh, and I didn't. And maybe because the kids I hung around with didn't get involved in that either. Most of us either got a part-time job, so you had a job, you know, either after school or on the weekends. So when I, I didn't get involved in sports and things like that. Uh, I regret that now that I didn't. Uh, and I guess I don't know if we looked at. The after school stuff, it was that we didn't fit in, maybe. I, I don't know. Uh, but I think probably because we were 
uh, busy, you know, with stuff at home and a uh, part-time job here and there. Do you, did you ever feel like that you were treated differently in school because you were Latino? Mm, no, I don't think so. I didn't feel that. Do you, uh, you say you didn't feel that. Do you think others, uh, do you think that there were other uh, Latinos who might have been treated differently, even though it didn't happen specifically? Yeah, and, and I think so, and especially uh, some of the some of the kids that came from neighborhoods that weren't uh, uh, as well off, I think. That's kind of what I remember. Uh, uh, you know, there was a lot of kids that, uh, some of the kids lived in the projects, things like that. I think they, you know, they may have had some issues and stuff like that, but, uh, you know, I was lucky that my, my dad worked and my mom um, worked cleaning houses, so, mm -hmm. you know, we had uh, money for clothes and uh, vacations here and there. I mean, you know, I didn't consider ourselves poor at all. So, uh, you said you, uh, you, part of the reason you did, may not have uh, participated in extracurricular activities is because you had a, a job after school? Yeah, I think a job. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what did you do after school? I, I remember uh, yeah, my dad got me the job. Um, it was me and my cousins. We worked down at, um, uh, not Pinehurst, but uh, Columbine um, Country Club. So we worked in the, in the kitchen and I was a dishwasher. Uh, one of my cousins was a bus boy, uh, so we'd work we'd work down there, you know, part time um, during the summer and then uh, during school, in high school. Uh, well, you know, once we start working, we had some money. You know, you could yeah. you could afford to have a car and put gas in it. So you bought? Did you buy your own car after? No, at the time, my I would borrow you know the parents' car after I got a driver's license, and then I did. Well, it made some money. My dad had bought a car, and then I was driving all the time, so I took over the payments on it. Uh, so you know, we had we had decent cars. So was that important to you to have a little little money in your pocket? Yeah. Well, I remember my mom telling me that if I was going to have a girlfriend, I need to have money to take her out. <laughs> <laughs> like I guess that was one of the yeah. encouragements. <laughs> hey, that, that's probably true still today. <laughs> yeah, sure it is. <laughs> uh, did you the education you received? So you graduated. You graduated. Yeah, I graduated. From high uh, graduated high school, and then you know when you turn eighteen, you had to volunteer for the or not volunteer, but you had to sign up for the draft. Mm -hmm. um, and I what got year, what year was that? That was sixty eight. So sixty eight, you you signed up for the draft. For the draft, right? And and it didn't take <laughs> it took me a little while to figure out that um, that's when the Vietnam War was starting up. You know that. Uh, I had trouble finding jobs because uh, the first thing you'd ask is your draft number. And I think I had like 137 or something like that. So a lot of people, they, would, they wouldn't hire you because they were afraid you're going to get drafted. So it was a little hard finding, um, uh, uh, you know, a decent job, I guess. You know, you'd work somewhere for a while. So some of the first jobs I had, I, I mean, I worked in there at, uh, at, at the um, country club. Then I worked at uh, Montgomery Wards for a while, working in the catalog department. Worked there for a while, and then I uh, got a job at. Uh, uh, there was a. Um, it, was, it wasn't quite a restaurant, more like a. Uh, they served um, roast chicken and stuff like that. I was on Carmel Boulevard. Worked there for a while as a dishwasher, and then I got a job for a company called General Marketing. Um, they did uh, silk screening. They used to do uh, uh, road signs and things like that. Uh, posters and things like that. And that was kind of interesting job. You know, I learned uh, some of the printing business there, uh, and then uh, the company, uh, <laughs> they, the some of the employees wanted to go union. Uh, so unfortunately, the it was a small business, and the guy couldn't afford a union, so closed up shop. Uh, so that was one of my first experiences with unions. Uh Expand a little bit on the on the lottery draft number. How did how exactly did I? You said you were one thirty. One, I kind of remember one thirty seven. One thirty seven. So that meant that uh, there was one hundred and thirty six people who were ahead of you, but you were. Is that how it worked? Or? Well, yeah, and I and I don't uh, right, and, and I when they started out, I don't know they call everybody had number one, 
you know, did call them. Did, I don't know if there was a range of numbers, however it went, and I'm, I'm not sure how they picked the numbers, but the ones that had the higher numbers, I don't know how high they went, they weren't as likely to be called. So I knew eventually that I would probably be, be called, depending on how the war was going. Uh, and that was in, in 68. I didn't get drafted until 70. So I, I had a couple of years to work, but that was always... Uh, that was always looming in the Yeah, in the looming, yeah, the when, when would you get drafted. Um, so after I bounced around a couple of different jobs, I got a job at uh, St. Joseph's Hospital working as an orderly. So for you, it wasn't a matter of would I get drafted, but, but when. Well, you, when. Knew, you knew yeah. that that, think, was, that was going to happen. Yeah, I, you know, I was hoping it wouldn't, but um, I remember my uncle Alex had joined the service. He graduated in 65 from, uh, from um, West High School. And that's when Vietnam was first starting, so I know the family was worried about him. Uh, but he joined on a buddy plan, so he and his first cousin and a high school friend of theirs all joined together. They all went to Germany together. Uh, and we were always worried that they were going to send him to Vietnam. Uh, it kind of, it didn't dawn on him until later on that it would probably be me and, and my other cousin, Paul. Uh, Paul, uh, I think, got drafted first, and then I did the year afterwards. What what was the mood of the country like? Would you recall? Do you look back on that now? I mean, what was what were some of the things that were happening in 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 the country and 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 in your community during during this? Well, time? you know, and well, I, I don't remember so much in our community the friends and stuff like that. I know a lot of us didn't, you know, we didn't go to college. We didn't have the money. A lot of them were just finding jobs. Uh, some that were able to go to school got uh, had deferments. Um, but I remember that was the time when uh, uh, kind of the hippie movement and uh, Gorky Gonzalez was active then. Uh, you know, you would see the draft card burning and uh, things like that going on. Um, Woodstock, things like that. Uh, and, uh, how, how, was, uh, how did that affect you? I mean, what were your, what were your thoughts about what was going on? Mm, you know, I, I kind of... I had a, I had kind of a mixed feeling, um, and at that time, and I didn't know my uncle Bill had, had been in Korea, so there was nobody in the family that had uh, been in combat that I knew. Uh, uh, you know, I guess I didn't I I didn't realize Uncle Willie and my uncle Manuel had been in Korea. You know, we had never really talked about it, and they never, you know, we never sat down and talked about that. You know, the ones that were in the service never talked to the ones of us that might go. Uh, and I'm not sure why the, those discussions never happened. Uh, and on my dad's side, we weren't real close to my dad's side, so I don't know if there was anybody on that side that had gone into service. But there was always the thought of, of Vietnam. Uh, you know, you would see the news reels on TV at night and stuff like that. Uh, so it was always the thought of, of going. You remember do you remember Dan Dan Rather reporting live from Vietnam and, mm -hmm. and, and the daily the daily uh, body count or mm -hmm. the what, what 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 kind of things were going through your head? I mean, you hear mm -hmm. here Vietnam is looming around the horizon for you, and you're thinking, hey, you know, I'm probably going to have to go. What were those sort of images that were bl blasting out from the TV there? Did that did that affect you in any way? Did you mm -hmm. think about that? Yeah, I think I did. Uh, you know, and uh, I know my cousin Paul went first, uh, uh, but you know, I, I never wrote to him. <laughs> you know, and when he came on leave, uh, he got involved. You know, he was he had a girlfriend, so got married, stuff like that. So uh, as he uh, got older, we kind of went separate ways, even though we were closer, we were younger. But we never really talked about it and stuff like that. Uh, I had a friend of mine. Uh, who was a couple years older, and he he went to Vietnam, and we used to write. Uh, and I, you know, I looked at that one at the time that I would go. Um, and you know, and you would, some of you were sometimes worried, you know. And then, and then when I did get drafted, uh, it was kind of at that time. <laughs> I was uh, I always messed around with the card, you know, racing and stuff, all stuff. I didn't get to any. Uh, Point. So, and actually, when I got drafted, I, I, uh, uh, 
I was the verge of losing my driver's license. So, you know, I thought, well, if I didn't go, what am I going to do? Because I don't have a license anymore. So when I got drafted, I, you know, I, I finally decided to join. One of my, one of my uncles talked to me, and, and he says, well, you know, once you, once you join, and see if you can get a school. Um, so that's when I decided to join. So you weren't actually drafted. You, you, you well, knew you I, were going. To... Yeah, when I got the draft notice, yeah, I had to report. Oh, okay. Yeah, so so before I reported, I, I uh, well, I went down and reported, and uh, I had to check in. Um, so then, in the meantime, I decided to to go to the recruiting station. And I decided to join because uh, the draft it, it was two years. So I decided, well, maybe I'll join and get a, a different job because uh, my uncle told me once you get drafted, they kind of do whatever they want. If you join, you have a little bit of a chance to do some of that. So you try to do a little preemptive uh, strike. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting that it, let me ask you this: if you had had the opportunity to go to college. Would you have gone? You know, <laughs> I would like to say yeah, but I don't know. You know, at that time I didn't have, I guess, a lot of confidence in myself, and I didn't know if I could make it through college. I mean, I was just an average student, and at that time it wasn't. I didn't look at it as going to college to get out of get out of the draft, or or even educate myself to get a bit a better job. So you so you didn't view college as a way of. Of getting out of going to the military. No, I didn't. I didn't look at. If it. you had gone to college, it wouldn't have been for that reason. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I wish, wish I would have been smarter then than <laughs> I was. You, but. when you say you didn't, you didn't have the confidence, or you didn't, you weren't sure if you could make it in college. Is that because you were an average student in in high school, or? Yeah. Well, I think uh, I don't know if I didn't have the interest in because I know when I graduated, my uh, my mom and dad. Um, had talked me into, uh, uh, I'm not sure how it happened, but I ended up, I was going to Parks Business School mm -hmm. for a while. And and I guess because it was different in high school, you know, in high school they kind of hold, hold your hand where you're going. Mm -hmm. Well, when you get into college, I mean, you choose your own class, you got to go get your own books and all that kind of stuff. I was kind of lost in that world. Yeah. I didn't know what to do with myself, and I was working part-time. Um, and I, I guess I didn't... Uh, uh, I didn't have the interest, I guess, uh, and then I got I got drafted, so I, d I didn't uh, complete the the course there. If do you, when you were in high school, do you recall the uh, student guidance, what they have called guidance counselors? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did they any of them ever mention uh, possibility you, you might be college material? You know, I don't remember that. Uh, I know they used to have a career day. Yeah, uh, and they had. Uh, different people there. I don't remember people from colleges were there, but they had uh, firefighters, uh, uh, you know, construction work, stuff like that. And I don't remember. All blue collar? Uh, yeah, all kind of blue collar type stuff, yeah. Uh, and I, I don't remember if there's any army recruiters or any piece mm -hmm. like that. Uh, I was, I was, uh, but the guidance counselors in, in high school, did, did, do you ever remember them having a, a discussion with you saying, Ernie, have you thought about what you're going to do after high school? Have you thought about college? So nobody, nobody pushed, nobody tried to push you. Yeah, and, and you know, it might have been there, but I don't remember that. Uh, if it did, I guess I didn't. I guess it wasn't important. I guess because I didn't, I didn't go that way. And I never thought of uh, going to school and get some kind of uh, skill. It was uh, mostly see if you can find jobs around town. You know, you know. When when Vietnam started, I guess, what was that, 65? Well, actually, uh, there was an announcement that the U.S. involved was in 1964, but okay. the U.S. was involved as early as the early 50s. So how, how, how old were you in 64? 64, 14. 14. So you don't you don't recall very much about Vietnam or what 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 that meant to you? No, not a whole bunch. It wasn't until my uncle Graduated in 65, and I think he actually went in 66 when he went to service. And that's when Vietnam was was starting up, and we were worried about him going. We used to hear about it in the news. Uh, probably, I don't remember if we read it in the newspaper, but uh, I mean, it was in the news about that as the war was getting more and more involved. And it wasn't 68 when I graduated. That's when uh, Vietnam was, you know, full full blown war. Mm -hmm. uh, 
In in '68, uh, had uh, had Kennedy and Martin Luther King already been assassinated? When you? Oh yeah, yeah. Because Kennedy was killed in '63, I believe. No, I meant uh, I meant uh, I'm sorry, I meant Robert Kennedy. No, I, I don't remember then. Uh, how about Martin Luther King? I uh, I remember the NBA and Santa, but I don't remember. I think it was before I went to mm -hmm. service. Mm -hmm. Did those two events have an impact on you? Or? Uh. Yeah, I think, but uh, it wasn't like Kennedy's death. Yeah. Uh, the other ones, I mean, it was sad to see uh, Martin Luther King, where he was a, um, an activist, you know, mm -hmm. trying to make things better, and he was uh, killed for his efforts. Uh, Kennedy, uh, at that time, I really didn't understand, you know, why he had gotten killed and, uh, you know, how his involvement with uh, organized crime and all that type of stuff, he was putting pressure on him. Um, and then there's all kinds of theories now as to why <laughs> some of that yeah. stuff happened. Uh, so in 68 then, you were 17, 18 years old? 18. Mm -hmm. And you certainly were old enough to understand that there was some, some really monumental upheaval taking place mm -hmm. in the country, the civil rights movement, assassinations, uh, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, uh, uh, Tet Offensive, I believe was yeah, the Yeah, Tet the Offensive, I remember offensive. the Kent State shooting. Kent State. I remember State. that stuff going on. Uh, you know, the people burning the draft cards. Uh, it was, you know, people against Vietnam, uh, Vietnam veterans against Vietnam. So I knew that there was, um, that's a lot of political issues going on with the war. Did you did you have any any strong feelings one way or the other on what was going on? Mm -mm, not really. So we're in the nineteen sixty eight. You graduate from uh, Lincoln High School in Denver. Uh, you have a a very strong feeling that you are going to be soon drafted and uh, you're you're just waiting for your for your notice uh, what were your what were your feelings just before you got drafted I mean what had you made any plans had you thought about your future and uh, where you might be going from here and uh, well a little bit and I think some of the things that happened is, uh, um, you know, the driver's license thing I had coming up, I knew I was going to lose my license. Uh, you know, I, I thought if I joined, uh, I'd have a better better chance of uh, getting a different type job rather than going to Vietnam. Uh, but I think it didn't, it didn't bother me that I'd go over there. I wasn't uh, afraid of that. Uh, and on the other hand, I kind of looked at it, uh, I would... I would be the first one in my family to uh, to be in a, a combat zone, and I guess I kind of looked at that because my dad never went to the service, and I didn't have any other other uh, close relationships I knew. I mean, and, you know, it wasn't later on that I realized my uncle Manuel and uh, Uncle Bill were in Korea, but I, at the time, the family never really talked about it. We didn't know that. You know, I knew my Uncle Bill was in the service, but we never, never discussed it. Uh, That's interesting that you say because your father didn't serve. Did you feel a special obligation, maybe, to to serve? You know, and I think, um, I think you're probably right. I think I felt I needed to do that. At the time, my mom and dad were going to divorce, uh, so I kind of felt that I was, I was becoming the man of the family, uh, and I don't know if that's one of the reasons that I kind of looked at it that way. Would you would you maybe characterize that as being patriotic? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I felt, you know, it was your duty. You know, I, I, didn't, I never thought of joining before, um, but I felt that, I, you know, if I got called, it was, it was part of my duty to support our country. You know, I, I, never, I didn't have I wasn't against Vietnam. I, I wasn't involved enough politically to understand that at the time. I just knew that we were in battle. Uh, didn't really know all the consequences of the politics until I actually got in the service and got to 
talk with other people because mostly it was, you know, it was mostly the family that talked to some of the friends you had, but we never really got into the politics and things like that. It wasn't until I got to meet people from different parts of the nation that they actually figured out well, what was going on. At that time, we're just kind of going with the flow, you know. You gotta get your guy and expected it. Well, you know, you're going to get drafted and uh, do the best you can while you're there. Okay, you're anywhere up to 1968, uh, Robert Kennedy assassination, Martin Luther King, Tet Offensive. Uh, let's talk about some of the social movements on the home front. Uh, at that time, were you a member of the Chicano movement before you were drafted or enlisted? No. Did did, uh, did you uh, were you did you participate in any organizations like LULAC or the American GI Forum? And at that point, I didn't even know they existed. Did you uh, did you take part in any of the uh, demonstrations or or uh, any no. of the mm -hmm. any of the demonstrations that were going on at the time? Mm -hmm. Did you uh, did you support the war effort? Yeah, I think I did. Uh, you know, I knew there was a lot of politics going on with it, but I think I supported it. Uh, you know, I, at that time I wasn't exactly sure why we were there, uh, but you know, I felt if I got called up, it was my duty to do that obligation did you did you take the time to maybe study or maybe pay attention or understand why we were why we were there or mm, did you? I don't I you know I, I remember the news but I didn't actually go out and you know go look for stuff on my own uh, I guess the interest wasn't there I guess uh, I just at that time I kind of felt well if, if I'm called up, I'm called up. If not, I'm not. But I never, never felt an urge to, to go join. Uh, although, um, I, you know, um, situations were going on, you know, I lost my driver's license, stuff like that. It kind of looked like the logical way to go. Uh, Did, uh, would you describe yourself as a political person at the time, or were you no. pretty much a political, you yeah, know, just, you know. yeah. Do you uh, do you do you have a party affiliation? No, nah, do I? I've, I've, uh, last times I've been uh, um, independent, uh, unaffiliated, but it normally Democrat. Is there any particular reason for that? Or? Probably that's the way the family was. I guess. <laughs> Dad was a Democrat. Yeah, yeah, Democrat. yeah. Right. Yeah, we never really talked about it at home. Uh. Yeah, at, at that time in our country's history, there was also the the larger civil rights movement that was uh, that was in full effect, uh, particularly for African Americans, and to a lesser extent in '68 uh, for for Chicanos. Although, you know, Cesar Chavez was a prominent figure, uh, Corky Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Arrasonida party and so forth. Uh, the, what were your feelings about some of the things that were going on with respect to civil rights? Well, you know, I think that you know, I think uh, I knew about Cesar Chavez. You know what he was doing with the farm workers. Um, you know they're being treated very unfairly, uh, taken advantage of. So I, I was following some of that. Corky Gonzalez, I wasn't real sure. Uh, I remember. He came to my mom and dad's house one time, and I think it was right around 68, 69, 70, somewhere around there. And I, I'm not sure how my mom and dad got involved with that, and I don't remember them talking to, to me specifically about that. But I remember he came to my house and he wanted my mom and dad to join the, 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 the crusade for justice at that time. But I remember that there was demonstrations at West High School and stuff going on that Corky had helped uh, do that. And I remember one of them, they were uh, complaining because they, they didn't serve Mexican food in the cafeterias and stuff. Uh, to me, I, I thought well, that wasn't really a big reason to, uh, to demonstrate. You know, I mean, yeah, it'd be nice to have Mexican food in the cafeteria, but I didn't think that was a real reason to do that. And then uh, my mom and dad decided not to join. I'm not sure quite why. Uh, we never really discussed it, but the, what I knew, uh, that's when the Brown Berets had gotten 
put together and they were becoming a little more militant. And that, that for me, that kind of turned me off and I didn't, I wasn't interested in getting involved with that. And I don't know if I took a look at some of that, was the, if some of the people in the college, and I took a look at them as somewhat radical, I guess. And I was kind of more the middle of the road kind of person and really didn't have an interest to get involved with it at all. Okay. Uh, and it wasn't until actually when I got back from Vietnam that uh, I knew a little bit more about it, and but I still didn't um, feel I needed to join the movement for that. But were your feelings <clears throat> a little altered after the you know, Yeah, uh, when I came back, uh, I remember when I came back to Vietnam, there was a, a rally of some type going on. Didn't know enough about it, but it was over on 14th Avenue in, what about Lowell somewhere? It, it, I think it was a school at the time. So I remember, I remember the school building, and then there was a, a tall six foot, eight foot chain link fence around the field. And I remember they were, as you're coming in, they wanted uh, names. So <laughs> I knew there had been some stuff. Corky had gotten some trouble with the law and stuff like that. So I think I didn't even put my real name on the on the list. So I went with a buddy of mine, and and I remember that the brown berets were walking along the top of the roof of the building. And I kind of look, I mean, you know, are these guys, are they doing guard duty or, you know, why, what is, why are they on the roof? And I looked at it, you know, <laughs> and I guess when I, came, when I came back to Vietnam, I looked at it, well, these guys are just, they're just playing games. I mean, this, it's, it's not, it's not a war. I mean, you know, the enemy's not shooting at you. So I just hung around for a little while. I just, I just didn't like the atmosphere that was there. And, and I left. I never really got more involved with it. And I don't know, it's, because what have, had it gone on with before, but I just never felt a reason to get involved with that movement. Would you mm. say that? Would you say that uh, Vietnam uh, touched your life with respect to these kinds of demonstrations going on? Was it was it any different uh, after Vietnam? So you, when you before Vietnam, you had seen oh. some of this mm -hmm. going on. You didn't really particularly. Uh, want to join after, did, did, did the experience in Vietnam change in any way your feelings about some of the things that were happening in the country? No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, I think it did change. Um, uh, it made me more aware of how much public uh, resentment there was towards the war, that there was a lot of support for the war. Uh, and I remember when I was in Vietnam, you know, we there was the Stars and Stripes. We'd get news articles and stuff like that. They'd have the the TV going on. You could see all the demonstration going on. And that's when I realized how unpopular the war was. Uh, but it didn't change my feeling that I should demonstrate against the war. Uh, did the the unpopularity of the war uh, did that did that touch uh, that you know did that spur any feelings? In you, or, or was it? Well, it, it it didn't it didn't spur my feelings against the United States. You know that we were there. It made me take a look at some people around me. Uh, I remember when I came back from Vietnam. <clears throat> would come back on a civilian plane. Uh, got back to Fort Lewis, Washington. I don't even remember if they even gave us a debriefing. I know they gave us a new uniform and stuff like that. Uh, and I remember uh, there was some talk that the the, um, uh, the population, you know, there's demonstration stuff going on. And I, and I really didn't think it would it would involve me myself. But they gave us a bus pass to go to the airport. So I went to the restroom, and when I was washing my hands, I, a guy came up to me, and there was a gentleman, an old, older gentleman, and he comes up to me and he starts poking me on the chest, <clears throat> and he says, did you get these for killing babies? That's what he asked me, and, and I, it kind of shocked me. So I just kind of looked at him and just walked off. I didn't even respond to him at all. And, you know, and as they're waiting, you know, to board the plane, and I sat down next to a business guy, and the guy was wearing a suit, and uh, he asked where I was going. I said, I'm heading home to Denver. And, uh, he says, you come back to Vietnam? And I said, yeah. And he says, can I buy you a quarter of beer? And I uh, don't remember what the guy looked like, but I remember 
you know, he was he was a guy that, you know, didn't welcome me back home or anything. You know, right away he's jumping on you. And there's this other guy here, didn't know who I was, offered to buy me a beer. How did that make you feel when the guy said, "Did you get those for John Day?" <clears throat> you know, it it made me look at you know because I knew the Cali incident was going on. And that happened in 1968, but actually Cali didn't get. Uh, tried for that town in the 70s, and I was there when that happened. Uh, and it made me realize that then, you know, I had heard what was going on in the news, but I never thought it was going to affect me personally. I was real surprised at that. Uh, and then when I did come back, uh, got home, you know, I'd run into some of my buddies I was going to, uh, went to school with, some of them now in college and some of them. I mean, I went to a party one time, and it was, it was a gal I was talking to, she was going to college. When they asked, hey, where you been? And they told me, you know, I went to Vietnam, you know, worked, odd jobs came back. <clears throat> right away, they start, well, why are you there? And they, they start talking about all the politics going on, all that kind of stuff. And it just it just really turned me on. And I thought, you know, I was called up to do my duty. You know, luckily I came back in one piece. And after that, I, I, didn't, I didn't mention it. <laughs> I was a Vietnam vet because I, I wasn't interested in uh, creating a conflict with somebody, stuff like that. Uh, so I just kind of didn't even say that anymore unless somebody asked. I didn't, I mean, you know, didn't openly come out and say I was a Vietnam veteran or, or get involved in demonstrations, you know, for the war or against and stuff like that. I just kind of tried to stay to myself. So the fact that, <coughs> the fact that you didn't yeah. want uh, people to ask you about did you kill any babies or or a bunch of experiences in the world kind of made you just shy away from the subject altogether. Yeah. Even even to the point where you just didn't even, didn't even mention that you were in, in the military or that you were in Vietnam. Yeah, you know, I didn't, unless somebody specifically asked me, I didn't, I didn't just volunteer that information. Uh, you know, I just, uh, I was real surprised that the, the public was that strong against the war. There's, there's, there can be, I don't think any, any doubt that that people are changed, you know, by <coughs> by those experiences. That uh, you go in as as one person, you come out, uh, and your experiences kind of kind of define define you know who you are or what you've done. And do you feel like you're a changed person because of uh, because of your experiences? And oh yeah, yeah, I think so. You know, uh, I looked at my personal experience. We weren't, uh, you know, compared to some other guys that ran into problems. I mean, some of them had a lot worse. But but sometimes I wonder did did some of these people create their their own issue? Because some people came back. Some of the Vietnam guys came back really militant, uh, very uh, bitter. Uh, I was lucky that I, I you know I didn't get wounded. Uh, you know, I can see where some guys that they were. Um, shot, uh, disabled, or whatever like that, would have some bitterness. <clears throat> and then, uh, um, you know, guys, not even my own cousins and families, you know, they suffer from PTSD. Uh, and I wonder, uh, you know, how that changed them. Some of them are still very bitter. I don't, I don't think I had that bitterness that was there. Did you talk about Vietnam to them? <clears throat> no, you know, and that's, that's the sad part. You know, my cousin Paul was there. Um, we never sat down and had a beer or, or anything and talked about it. It's not till now later, and you hear it 40 years later, that we're actually talking about that. You know, you know my Uncle Bill. Uh, when we came back from service, we never, we never sat down and said, well, how you doing? You know, do you want to talk about anything? We just, it was just, it was just one not even mentioned. Just, do you think that was just kind of, something that was understood between men or between soldiers that told you don't go there or I don't want to talk about that or do you think that do you think that soldiers kind of share that or they kind of have a an insight into other soldiers about that yeah you know and that's you know that's a real, a real interesting question because I you know until until I joined the GI forum and got more involved um, you just, you know, you ran into it. You knew he was in the service, but you never really sat down and say, well, what'd you do? You know, are, are you okay? Or even say, welcome home. Uh, didn't didn't do that, and I'm not sure why we didn't do that. 
You know, at first I thought it was guys that were, uh, you know, heavy combat or, uh, you know, atrocities that they may have been involved in themselves. And they didn't want to talk about it. The, you know, they were ashamed to talk about it or whatever. Uh, I know in my case, uh, uh, you know, I guess because the Vietnam veteran wasn't uh, wasn't acceptable at open heart. I mean, there weren't any parades and all that kind of stuff. I got to the point where I didn't I didn't mention it at all. It wasn't until just a few years ago that we actually felt proud to to say, I, you know, I served in Vietnam. So, are you saying that? For 40 years, you you didn't have that that pride in, in having been there or having served, and now 40 years later, you feel like that it's okay. Now I can. I yeah, can talk and about I think, uh, and part of it was due. Uh, I don't know. It was my my uh, home life. Uh, I met my my future brother-in-law in the service. Uh, we were uh, both stationed at uh, Fort Rucker, Alabama, where I met him. Uh, it was at the beginning of one of the classes where they <clears throat> were to get something saying, where are you from? This guy got up in the back of the room and said, well, I'm Gary Martinez. I'm from Denver, Colorado. So after one day I gave a smoke break, you know, I went over and talked to him. Found out we knew a couple of people in common, and we got to be buddies, you know. And when we got back from Vietnam, you know, we'd hang around. You know, I eventually married his sister, but I remember my my wife at the time, uh, she didn't enjoy us talking about that. You know, we'd go over to the, the family, we'd have a few beers, and we'd start talking about some of the experiences. Uh, Gary was stationed in Trang. Uh, he wasn't, uh, didn't actually engage in actual combat, but he, you know, he saw incoming mortars to where he was at. He worked on uh, fixed wing aircraft. Well, we you know we'd, we'd have a few beers and start laughing about this, and. All that kind of stuff. And I remember my, my wife at the time would get upset and says, well, well, why are you guys laughing? I thought you were in a war. I said, well, yeah, we were. I said, well, how can you laugh? I said, well, it wasn't war every day. <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, there was other things. Uh, and I guess, and she and I never really sat down and talked about it. And I look at that, you know, we're divorced now. And I look at that, that we never, you know, I, I, we never uh, felt the need, I guess, to talk about it. And I remember a friend of mine, he was in Vietnam. We went to the movies, Apocalypse Now. And um, there's a scene in there where um, a bunch of helicopters land kind of in the, uh, kind of on the shore outside of a village. And uh, a woman runs up to the helicopter, uh, took her hat off, is down like that. And I knew immediately what was going on. So I you know she runs up to the helicopter, throws a satchel in it, and the helicopter blows up, and she takes off running. One of the other guys open up a machine gun and shot her, killed her. My wife just freaked out. She got up and and left the, the thing. And well, before she left, she says, "Did you do that?" And I told her, "No, I never shot a woman." And she says, "Well, that doesn't happen." I said, yeah, it does. It does happen. And she got up and walked out of the theater. And and I, you know, stayed for a little and I walked out, you know, to go point where she was. I didn't go back to the movie. How did that make you feel? You know, it, it uh in a way I was kinda hurt. Uh and I and I don't know if that created a little conflict. You know, I don't know if she thought that that I had killed children or, or women, even though I told her that I had not, but I saw it done. She was just totally freaked out. She says, you don't, you don't shoot women <laughs> and children. I said, it's, it's a war, you know? And, she, and we, never, we never really discussed it after that. And I had albums with pictures and stuff in them. Uh, she wouldn't allow me to, uh, to show the pictures. Uh, there were some that she removed. Um, and and we, did, we never talked about it. Do you think if, if things had been different, if the, if the war had had a successful ending and uh, had been supported by U.S. civilians uh, back home and uh, you'd gotten your ticker tape or welcome home, do you think 
things would have been better, you know, for Vietnam veterans? Uh, or do you think that because of that, that there's still a kind of an un underlying current of shame, even though you have, you don't feel personally ashamed, do you think that some, some Vietnam vets do feel a certain amount of shame and that's why they don't talk about it? Well, I, I think that's an interesting uh, observation. And, and as we go back and take a look at it, you have to throw career in there also. Uh, <clears throat> I think part of the problem uh, is that the U.S. didn't come back victorious, like World War II. You know, the war ended, uh, troops come back. Korea, kind of the unknown war, there's a lot of atrocities went on in Korea that people don't know. We're starting to know about it now, but we didn't come back victorious then. They would, uh, as far as I don't remember if there's any ticket tape parades, it was before my time. I'm sure my uncle would know about that. But I wonder if and my uncle also, you know, we never really sat down and talked about your feelings when he came back, stuff like that. I wonder if that was the beginning of U.S. involvement around the world, but we hadn't, we hadn't, there was no decisive win, there was no victory. You just kind of say, okay, well, we give up now, we'll everybody go home. And there was no, you know, one side or the other didn't, didn't win. In Vietnam, you know, we lost all those men, and, you know, the last days when they're pulling the people off of the embassy there, uh, it wasn't like we left in the countries and, you know, <laughs> you know, shake your hands and everything's great. It's like we got pushed out. And then finally the American public just didn't support it anymore. And, and I wonder, you know, we didn't feel victorious, yeah. and, and 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 some of the public felt the same way, and they didn't support the Vietnam veteran. Um, I'm sure Korea had some of that also. Um, Do you think that's the reason that people, or one of the reasons mm -hmm. that a lot of people don't talk about it? Hey, there's we we didn't win that war, you know, and it was unpopular. So no use talking about it, something mm -hmm. that. You know, well, you know, and, and it'd be nice to kind of put a label on it that way. But you look at World War II veterans, a lot of them, they haven't talked about their experiences. You know, and, and I I don't know if it's something that the guys just don't, I don't know if within themselves, they don't feel proud of something they did, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and there's some of them that are very talkative. You know, they'll, I mean, they'll sit there and tell you every little detail what went on. And other ones, they don't want to say a word. Uh, my, uh, my father at the time, I knew he was in World War II, but I wasn't, is involved with military history like I am now. It wasn't until he was dying, and that's when we had formed the color guard at the GR Forum, that I went over to the family and, and asked if they would like a color guard. Uh, and when I got a DD-214, well, I saw that he was in the Battle of the Balls. He was there in Boston. And I remember him talking a little bit about it, but I guess at the time I didn't understand enough about the military history and what was going on that I didn't realize uh, the significance of him being in a major battle like that and, and surviving it. You know, there's a lot of men that were killed in Boston, and he, he made it through. And I look at it now that I wished I would, I would have known more about that. But he never, he never really talked about it. And I, you know, I don't know why, I don't know why some guys don't bring that up. How soon after uh, basic training uh, did you go to Vietnam? My well, training was eight weeks, and then I went to uh, Fort Rucker, Alabama, for um, helicopter. When I when I got drafted, I decided to join, and and now I wonder if I made a career mistake because uh, they give you the aptitude test. Well, one of the things that I scored high in, the the recruiter there wanted me to join the NSA, which was the Army Security Agency. Well, it was for four years, and I didn't want to go for four years. I mean, I wasn't that crazy about going in the first place. So, but I, but I did well in mechanical and stuff like that. So I, I had my schooling I was going to go for was helicopter repair. I was thinking, well, when I come back, I can work on helicopters or the police. How that's when the police were getting into helicopter stuff like that. So I went to um, basic training in June 1970, and then in. Uh, September, October, I ended up in Fort Rucker, Alabama, uh, and that's where I met my uh, future brother-in-law. Uh, I forget how long the training was there. I know it was October, 
you know, up into December. Um, and we went through the basic helicopter stuff, and I remember they came to us, they were looking for pilots, uh, and they wanted to, um, to be a pilot, you need to be a, an officer or a warrant officer. You know, so they came to asking for who wanted to, to be a pilot. So I look back at the, you know, you know, the opportunity that I had that I passed up. So I thought, well, let me look at this. So I did go in to see about becoming a, a warrant officer and going to flight school, but I, until then, I didn't know I needed glasses. So I, I didn't pass because I needed glasses. So I went on through the basic helicopter school, and then I remember when we first got there, they, <laughs> they, uh, uh, they showed us this movie. It was a sergeant, and uh, it, was a it was a movie about a door gunner. So this guy's out there firing and, you know, showing some of the missions and all that, and then the sergeant tells us, well, you'll be on flight status, you'll have uh, wings, and uh, I remember him saying, when you, when you come home and you walk into the airports, uh, you, you'll be just like the pilots, you know, the stewards are looking like a pilot and all this kind of stuff. So I put that down as one of my options, <laughs> the fourth option. So I put down, I had basic helicopter maintenance, and I, then I, I was interested in turbine engine repair, and then I put door gunner as the last entry. Well, sure enough, I, you know, they needed door gunners, so, so I got to school. So I think the school was like three weeks long for that. So when I got that school, you know, I called my mom, and I, I told my mom, you know, I, I don't think I'll be going to Germany. Um, I didn't, didn't think too much of it. Uh, At that time, then you knew yeah, I knew, yeah, when I got door gunner school, I knew they don't need door gunners in Germany. You know, they don't need them in, uh, in the States. You know, I, I knew I was going to go to Vietnam. How did uh, that make you feel? What'd you, what were your initial thoughts about going to Vietnam? Did you want to go? Did you not want to Well, you know, at, at the time I felt, uh, uh, yeah, you know, I felt, well, you know, we were at war. Um, you know, kind of felt that you know, maybe the... Little mantras. I mean, say, well, you know, be the first one in the family to go to combat. Uh, so I was kind of, kind of look, you know, kind of excited about it. You know, on the other hand, I like, you know, hope I make it back in one piece. Uh, you know, but I wasn't, I wasn't afraid to go. Would you say that uh, that was just part of your personality that you wanted to, you wanted to make your mark in the world? I, I, I noticed you said on a two or three other occasions I wanted to be the first one to do this. I mm -hmm. wanted to be, I wanted to serve, I wanted to, I wanted to do my duty. Uh, was this just part of the way you are? I, I want to. Yeah, I, I, and uh, now that you think, you know, you mentioned that, probably so. Uh, I guess I, I needed to prove to myself, I guess, that I could, I could do that. Uh, you know, I didn't, not that I felt that you'd be a coward if you didn't go to, to battle. But I thought, you know, this is my uh, opportunity, I guess, you know, to show what type of person I was. Uh, and I don't know if that's part of it, because my dad never went to service, and I, I don't know. I, th I, don't know, I think I asked you this before, but did you, did you feel like because your father didn't serve that you had a special obligation or a special duty to serve? Yeah, I think so. Would you say that that's because you feel like that this country, that you had a reasonably comfortable childhood, you weren't poor, you weren't rich, but you were, you, you didn't really want for anything, you, you lived in a fairly decent neighborhood. Is this part of like paying back for? Yeah, probably so. Uh, you, owed it, you owed it to your country to do this? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, it uh, wasn't that we had a, a history in our family of you know people going to the service and being in war stuff like that. It was never really discussed, uh, but I felt it was it was my my duty to do that. How old were you when you enlisted? And uh, where were you? Well, when I was in Denver. I was working at uh, St. Joseph's Hospital. I was twenty. What was your military branch? Uh, U.S. Army. Did you, uh, how did your family respond to your decision to, to enlist or to go? Uh, I, they responded well, and you know, the fact that I got drafted, <laughs> uh, 
they were they were fine with it. I you know didn't have any issues. Uh, my only um, reservation I had was that uh, my mom was going through. The, uh, well, in fact, I didn't even know. I knew my mom and dad were having problems. Uh, I didn't know until later on that my mom actually asked my dad to leave the day I left for the service. So once I got in, uh, I felt a little like I had my hands tied that I couldn't help my mom because I know she was having some rough times, but I wasn't there. You know, I couldn't come home and help her. Um, you know, I was, you know, I'd only kept money what I needed, especially when I went to Vietnam. We didn't need any money over there, really. So I would send everything else home. I fully expected my mom to use it. Uh, I was surprised when I came home I had some money in the bank. My mom never touched it. She had saved it all for you? Yep. How'd that make you feel? Any, any special feelings about that? <laughs> well, well I, you know, because I, I knew my mom was running some, some issues with, with my dad and the divorce and stuff like that. Uh, so I fully expected her to use it for whatever she needed. I mean, I was real surprised when I came home and she never touched it. Uh, how long were they? How long were your parents married? Mm, 25 years. And they divorced after 25 years. Mm -hmm. How was that? How did, how did you take that? Well, <laughs> I, mean, I knew they were running into issues, uh, and I could see the divorce not, you know, I mean, the thing not working out. Uh, what I was real surprised when I, when I came back, my mom had already remarried. I mean, it was only a year. Uh, that was a little tough to, to get used to that, because uh, I came back to the house that I left, and my mom was already married, and. Uh, her husband was living there. So that was a little tough. I didn't expect to have to deal with that when I came back. Did you resent that? Or? Mm, well, a little, for a little bit. Uh, not that I resented it. Why? And I kind of resented my mom getting married right away. I thought, gee, Mom, you know, I thought, you know, she'd be single for a while, but I think now she needed, needed the help, and she fortunately met a, you know, a nice man that would uh, support her, not only uh, emotionally, but uh, Financially, I think my mom needed it at that time. But you remained close to your parents? Both yeah. Parents. Well, no. <laughs> my mom, yeah, my dad, no. We had some issues when I came back. And, uh, I don't. To do with Vietnam or? Um, a little bit. Uh, a little bit. Uh, my, my younger brother, Donnie, joined the, six, the service six months after I did. Um, and he had uh, eczema since he had been young. Uh, he always had a rash on the inside of his arms. Well, when he joined the service, I guess the, the army blankets or whatever uh, made it worse. So he was uh, let out of the service because of that. Well, he was, <laughs> it was kind of my mom some grief. Uh, he, uh, he was growing marijuana on the, on the roof of the house, my mom found out. And then he got my younger brother involved with drugs. So this was all going through the mail. So when I came home from Vietnam, I was home on leave, and uh, my mom and dad were already divorced. Well, my, my dad came over to the house early in the morning. and um, was pounding on, on the front door. So I got up and opened the door, and he wanted to talk to my brother Donnie, and he was upset at my brother. So he kind of forced his way in the house, and I told him, you know, uh, first I told him, you know, if you ring the doorbell, we'll let you in. I told him, don't come pounding on the door. Well, he kind of forced his way in the house. So then he, he wanted to go to my, my brother's bedroom, and I wouldn't let him. I told him, well, Donnie's still asleep. I don't want you to come back later. So then we got in a big old discussion, and my dad, you know, tells him, well, you think you're a man now? I told him, yeah, I think so. He says, well, I made you a man. And I said, well, Dad, I... You know, I just came back from the war. I, you know, I, I think, I think being in the war, kind of, kind of made me a man, and he didn't like that comment. Uh, so he, uh, he looked at me, and I, and I said, "Oh, you, you know, he, he made a fist, or he had his hands down." I said, "You want to hit me?" And and I just looked at him and punched him right in the mouth. He punched you in the mouth. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't expect that. And so I just kind of, just kind of grabbed him, and, and kind of pushed him out of the door. 
And then by this time, my mom had gotten up, you know, she was crying and everything, so my mom ends up calling the police. So the police show up, you know, 15 minutes later, something like that. So my dad hopped in the car and took off. So, so the police come and ask me what happened, and they thought I was my mom's boyfriend, and I got a fight with, you know, with the, the husband. I don't know, I'm the son. <laughs> I don't know home I leave. And uh, so then, uh, so then my dad comes back, and the police asked, "Do you want to file charges?" And I said, "No." And so my dad comes back, and he's he's kind of laughing. He puts his hand. He wants to just shake my hand. And and I guess it pissed me off because he hit me. You know, I didn't think he would do that. Uh, so, and my dad, my dad left. I didn't talk to my dad for years, years, probably ten years or more. After you know, that. After that, yeah. And, and I remember I had a lot of animosity, uh, even though my dad would show up to some of the family functions. If he was in the house at the time, I couldn't talk to him. There was tension, a lot of tension. It took me years to get over that. Do you think that? Vietnam played a role in that, or was that just going to happen? Was that mostly due to the divorce? Uh, probably a combination of it. Uh, I know the divorce had a lot to do with that. Um, but I, I don't know. I, mean, I, remember, I remember when I came home on leave before I went to Vietnam, and I had lost weight, and my uniform was a little bit baggy on me. So my dad tells me, well, why don't you tell the Army just give me another one? I said, well, Daddy, don't work that way. You don't, <laughs> you don't tell them what to do. They tell you what to do. And so, and I guess I had a resentment towards that because my dad had never been in the service. Yeah. And and I, I guess, you know, maybe I had a little resentment towards that. And and I don't know if, if that kind of played a part of it. So he was talking about things he knew nothing about. Yeah, and that's... Yeah. Lecture you about it. Yeah, and that's kind of the way I felt, you know. I'm like, kind of, well, gee, Daddy never been there, uh, you know. And I, I don't know. I, I, that's probably part of it. And I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was a, a father-son kind of thing, you know. Say, you know, I'm a man now, Dad. You know? yeah. Do you do you think do you think that, uh, like, say for example, somebody else, some non combatant or even a non-veteran try to lecture you about Vietnam, you'd get the same kind of uh, resentment or, or maybe even worse because he wasn't related to you? Well... I mean, how, uh, how would you feel if somebody came up to you and said... Uh, today? Yeah. Today, I think... Uh, I think I'd be okay with it. You know, I, uh, you know, I think I look back at those days. I was probably resentful of my dad because he left my mom or... You know, what whatever happened. I think I was resentful of so that. It was more of that. Yeah, I think it was that that my dad wasn't there when, uh, you know, I left the service and my mom needed help and he wasn't there. Uh, so I think more of that resentment. I think now um, I'm more calm to hopefully a lot more mature. That if you know if somebody talks about that and they don't know, then I think I tell them, you know, you know, you weren't there, you know, and I take a look at it uh, more. Um, Calmly, I think, than I would back then. Were you uh, an, uh, what was your rank when you were in Vietnam? Uh, I, I left Vietnam as a spec four, as an E four. Were you were you married when you went to Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Were you dating your future wife? No, I hadn't met her yet. I did have a, you know, a couple of girlfriends here and there that I wrote to. Um, one of them was kind of breaking up when I left. Um, so there was you know, a couple of different ladies that I wrote to when I was there. So you went to uh, your basic training you took in... Fort Leonard Wood. Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Mis Missouri, mm-hmm. And then your special training in Alabama. Fort Rucker, mm-hmm. How many other Latinos were with you when you were in this uh, training facility? Mm, I don't know quite the numbers. Uh, there, w there was a fair amount. Uh, I'd say maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe a quarter of them were Latinos. Did, uh, did any of them speak Spanish? Yeah, there was some that did. There was, I forget his first name. Uh, last name was Rios. He was from Texas. They spoke Spanish. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, 
I spoke Spanish with Larry. Usually when we were drinking, we, we spoke a little bit. We didn't converse in Spanish, so, but, uh, and, and I, when I got along with most of them, I mean, I had some black friends, some uh, white in uh, Chicanos. I didn't hang around with one uh, special group of them, you know. I, I felt I, I uh, mixed in with all of them. What did you, did you miss the certain aspects of your culture, like the food? Or yeah, the yeah, well, I remember uh, uh, my mom, uh, when I was in Vietnam, well, even in, uh, <laughs> in AIT, uh, when we were there in Alabama, my mom used to make burritos. She'd freeze them, put them in a coffee can, and send them air mail. So we'd get them in a couple of days. Uh, then I'd, in there in Fort Rucker, they had a bowling alley, and they didn't have microwaves back then, but they had uh, toaster ovens. So we'd take them down there, and uh, the gal at the bar would warm them up for us. You know, <laughs> the she didn't know what they were, so we'd hey, you know, warm them up. And there was one guy, I don't remember his name now. He was from, uh, he was from down south somewhere. Well, he really, he really liked them. He says, well, you think your mom sent me something? I said, yeah. And uh, so he gave me some money. He says, well, you know, what would it cost? I said, well, I don't know. He gave me like 10, 10 bucks, something like that. So my mom made a whole bunch, and, uh, you know, we brought them, <laughs> gave them to him. You know, we'd go out and have a few beers, warm them up, and then about uh, by about a week later, he, uh, he was complaining. He, was, he felt bad. He, was, he felt sick. And he says, uh, I, says well, I don't know why I'm really sick. And, and he said, stomach hurt and everything. And, uh, and he says, you know, I don't know if it was one of those burritos. I said, what, the, what? You still have the burritos? And then what do you got him? And he says, in your wall locker? I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. You can't store the beans and the chili that long, you know. I didn't never be real, real. I thought we ate them all the first night, you know. So I'm surprised I didn't poison him. <laughs> but but I remember my mom used to send me the hatched chili in the cans. We'd go to the PX, we'd buy some crackers. We used to make our little soul sandwich and with uh, crackers and uh, chili. <laughs> So that, that was that was important to maintain that aspect of your culture. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we missed the food. Yeah. Was it, uh, did you share them with other Chicanos in the? Yeah, the guys that were there. Yeah, and, and of course they were in Alabama. You know, we'd go out and leave. I mean, there was no Mexican restaurants there at all. Uh, so. No, no, no. No. Yeah, well, I mean, we didn't have a car, so we didn't go far. I mean, we'd just go inside the town there, but there wasn't any Mexican food at all. Did you? Did you pal around with other other Hispanics? And, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and well, and I'd met Gary, you know, uh, so he and I uh, developed a close... Uh, and you were both from Denver. Yeah, we were both from Denver, yeah. So you you, you managed to retain a little bit of your culture right. while, you were in the, while you were in the military. Yeah. Uh, is that important? Yeah, I think it is. I, you know, I mean, a little bit more of your culture, they understand a little bit more. Uh, but I had, you know, other, other buddies, uh, but mostly, you know, I hung around with Gary. Uh, was there an AIT? Is that was that who you mostly hung out with? In, in yeah, when I was in AIT, and then uh, he um, he was taking a different courses than I was, so I I finished mine first, and I went home on, on leave. So I got his uh, parents' address, so I went to go visit his parents when I was on leave, and then when he showed up, he went to go visit mine, and then we both went to Vietnam, but we got stationed in different places, uh, and we would write to each other while we were in country. But I didn't see him until when I was ready to leave. Any special or uh, enduring memories about basic? Mm. Yeah, uh, I remember one time uh, we had a drill sergeant, uh, I forget, his, I mean, he was Chicano. And uh, he got after me because I, I would forget which way to turn, you know, left or right. So he gave me a big rock one time to carry. <laughs> you carry this rock for a while. When I say left, you turn left. <laughs> and I remember he he invited us the Chicanos to go to his house one time to, for burritos and stuff like that. But he he never uh, never made good on it. But but I think he used to treat the Chicanos okay. I think he used to kind of look after them. Do you feel like that the uh, kind of training that the military gave you at AIT or or machine gun? Helicopter or just basic training. Did they prepare you? Uh, did you get? Were you well prepared to go to Vietnam when you went? Uh, yeah, for the most part, I, th I think so. Uh, I remember, um, you know, they had the survival class in case you got shot down or something like that. So they, they took us out in the forest there and taught you a few things. But the the gunner school um, first they put you on an elevated tower with a machine gun so you could learn to shoot from up above. Um, 
Then they had the target moving so you could learn to follow it. Then they put you on the helicopter and they take you flying around. Well, you flew around in the big arc and they had a, a target down. It was made out of sheets, so you used to shoot at the, at the sheets. And then we did that at night. Well, when I, when I, <laughs> when I got to Vietnam, uh, the first thing I found out is that uh, they wouldn't let me fly until I got glasses. Well, I knew I, that my eyes weren't good enough to be a pilot, but they, but they never issued glasses. So, so I had to wait for them to issue me glasses while I was there. So in the meantime, they had me doing some other, other duties and stuff. And uh, when I did get my glasses, I um, went on the first mission. One of the first missions we went on, there was a fixed-wing aircraft that uh, there was about, oh, about six or seven officers on this plane. Um, it, it disappeared. I don't know if it got shot down or what. So we were out looking for it. So it wasn't supposed to be a combat mission, but we were out flying around. And uh, the pilot was saying, hey, if you see something, just let me know. You know, So you know, you're on your radio, so you're out there looking around. And I say, oh, I see, I see something over there. So the pilot just needed me to turn. Uh, he'd make it a 90 degree turn. Well, they didn't do that <laughs> in the training. It was up, you know, level flight and then come back down. There was no aerobatic type flying. So the first time, it just scared the shit out of me. <laughs> so it would be flying along. I thought I was going to fall out of the helicopter because I think it turned. Weren't, uh, you, weren't you strapped in? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, we, yeah, you were strapped in, but on, on the helicopter, the, 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 the crew chief and the gunman faced this way. The helicopter's flying that way. You faced to the outside this way. And uh, the machine gun was mounted on a pedestal, uh, so you didn't have to actually hold it. Then they had what they call a monkey strap. So you put the strap around your waist, and then it was a 10-foot strap, and you hooked it on the back of the helicopter. That's so you could kind of get up and walk around a little bit with it. So if you fell out, you'd fall out 10 feet. Uh, you know, but when you were flying, you know, they'd do a 90-degree bank right away. I mean, you're looking at, at you know, the forest down, down there. So it, it took me a little while to figure out that, you know, the circle forces you weren't going to fall out of the thing. Uh, you know, so by the end of the day, I kind of got used to it, but it freaked me out the first times. Were you, was part of your basic training, did they, did they brief you about the uh, terrain or the culture in Vietnam? I mean, <coughs> when, you, uh, when you got to Vietnam and you saw the people, the Vietnamese, and the difference in, in cultures, was it, uh, was it what you had expected? Yeah, yeah I think it was. Uh, you know, they would take us out on some, uh, even though it, it wasn't jungle, it was forest. It was there in, in Fort Rucker and then in, uh, uh, there in basic training. We got more of that when we got into AIT. Uh, most of us were looking at if we got shot down, uh, how to survive out in the jungle and stuff like that. So they, they would talk to you about uh, the cultures, uh, the enemy itself, you know, the Viet Cong, uh, the NVA. Uh, you know, they taught you the weapons and how to take them apart. If the helicopter went down, what you could use on the helicopter. Uh, what they needed us to do is the crew on the helicopter. You know, first, you know, we had to we had to get the pilots out because the, the pilots, when they get in, they have a bulletproof um, shield that comes on the side. The, the seat is bulletproof, and this thing here. Well, because it sits up about this high, they can't open the door. So it was up to the crewmen to open the door from the outside so the pilot could get out. So that was one of our duties. And then there was the radios that was in there. One of them was an encryption radio. We had to get that radio out of the helicopter if we were going to abandon it. So they taught you things like that. Did they, uh, did you know about the history of Vietnam? Yeah, they, they, you know, the biggest thing they taught us that we were there before communist aggression. <laughs> uh, I don't remember if I learned about the French, you know, being wiped out there while I was there in Vietnam or through the training, or if I learned that afterwards, I, that I don't remember. But I, you know, they did talk about some of our involvement, but most of it, um, propaganda, I guess. You know, we were there for to fight communist aggression. That's why we were there. That's that's what you understood. Yeah, that's we're, what we understood. We're here to stop right. communist aggression. Right. And you were okay with that. Sure, that was fine. You still feel that yeah. today? Yeah, I still do. I mean, I know. There's a lot more that was involved with that. There was a lot of other politics, uh, economic type stuff. You know, there was uh, companies over there with uh, economic interests and stuff like that, and we learned that later. Was it was it what you expected when you got to Vietnam, and, and was it 
say, here I am, and, and uh, was it everything that they told you it would be and everything you expected it to be? Mm, probably not. I, I remember when we landed at Cameron Bay, uh, they opened up the doors, uh, turned off the air conditioner in the helicopter, I mean in the plane. The first thing you felt was like walking into an oven. When you came out of the doors, it was so hot and humid. And I wouldn't prepare for it to be that that uncomfortable. Uh, we're not in Denver anymore. Yeah, we're not in Denver, yeah. Uh, and then uh, I, I began, was in Cameron Bay, and I had to fly somewhere else. So uh, I had to wait the next day for a flight. So they told us with our travel orders we could go to the enlisted men club. Uh, so we uh, I ran into some guy, I don't even know who he was now. We went down to the enlisted men's club. We weren't in there 15 minutes and a fight broke out inside the club. Uh, that's when I realized that there was some uh, differences with the, with the black soldiers. We went into this uh, enlisted men's club and the pilots carry a pin flare. They have a vest that they wear, kind of like a, kind of reminds me of a fishing vest, it was like a net. And on that they hang uh, these uh, little flares. Uh, they look like a, looks like a pen, a metal pen. Well, it's designed if the if the pilot gets shot down, to shoot through the jungle. So there's red ones and green ones. Well, we were inside the EM club and a fight breaks out, and these guys were shooting these little pen flares inside the club. Well, that thing is run off a 22 shell. Uh, so if it hits you, and I'm sure, it, uh, I don't know if it'd kill you, but it it would probably hurt a whole bunch. But these guys are firing these things all over inside that club. So we got our way out the door and went back. And I thought, wow, I hadn't even got to where I'm supposed to be yet, and there's already danger from our guys. I was real, I, do, I wasn't prepared for that. They didn't talk anything about that. And once I got where we were, there was a lot, a lot of animosity with the blacks. We had a lot of problem with blacks. Whites against blacks? Uh, yeah, more, yeah, more or less. Uh, I don't know if they were militant or what, what the reason was. Uh, you know, we did have a black platoon sergeant that I, you know, I got along with well, but where I was at, uh, uh, those soldiers were mostly in the motor pool, uh, um, uh, in the kitchen, stuff like that. They, uh, where I was at, they didn't, there wasn't any of them that was on a flight platoon other than the sergeant. But um, and we didn't have any that I know that worked on the helicopters, none of the mechanics and stuff like that that worked on the helicopters. Uh, so where, where did the animosity stem from, do you think? You know, well, you know I, I, I don't know exactly. I don't know if it was part of the, the black movement, you know, the, um, uh, the Black Panthers, all that other kind of stuff. Uh, and I noticed that in, in uh, not so much in basic training, but when we got to uh, Alabama, uh, we got off the bus from the from the airport, and I remember uh, it was about ten o'clock at night, and we we got off the bus and we're getting our gear, and there was some black soldiers there. They're harassing us, you know, the new guys coming in, not me specifically, but the whole thing. And then there was um, in the base there was a big open area, uh, and they used to call it the DMZ. Well, they would caution us not to go out not to cross that field at, at night because the grass was about this tall, I guess. Well, I guess they had a lot of incidents where the white soldiers were being beat up out there by the blacks. They had a lot of problems with that. Uh, so it started in the AITs where I saw most of it going on, that some kind of um, uh, racism or um, animosity that were going on. And then in Vietnam, uh, it was at least where I was at, they, they had a lot of problems with that. You know, and I tried to try to stay away from that, but uh, uh, I was real surprised at some of that. Uh, I remember one time at the EM club there at the base. Um, I don't know if there was animosity between the flight crews and these other guys. So, because the, the flight crews, you know, we used to leave for the day, sometimes three days, depending on the mission, and we'd come back. And it was in the EM club, and a fight broke out. Um, it was the white against the blacks, and uh, when when <laughs> when we ordered beer, the beers didn't have the pop top on it, so they would just bring a, 
full cans of beer. And we had a church key to open it. Well, we'd order so much, you know, there'd be a whole table. It was, they'd just bring the beer by the case. We'd just stack it up. And when the fight broke out, the guys were picking up full cans of beer and just throwing them, throwing them across the nightclub there. And a guy, a buddy of mine, we um, walked out of the club and get out of the, of the fighting. We went out on the front, it was like a sidewalk, and one of our guys from the flight platoon was out there. He was just all beat up, all bloodied up. So we picked him up and we brought him back inside the club, and the people in there kicked us out. I said, you guys can't come back in here. So we are going back out, and we had him in between us. And we were going across the road, and it's kind of like a ditch that goes through there. So we were carrying this guy. We are going to take him over to the infirmary. And these, these big black guys come up and came over to me and said, are you Mexican? And I said, yeah. And he threw me aside. He took this buddy of mine, just threw him in the ditch and just beat the hell out of him. Uh, and we didn't have, where we were at, we didn't have any MPs at all. So I went back to the barracks, and because I was on the flight platoon, we used to keep our, our M16 rifle in our wall locker. So when I got back there, I took the wall locker and my weapon was gone. Well, it turned out my uh, one of the roommates, he was a Puerto Rican, he, uh, he was so scared, he, he took my weapon, he was over in the corner uh, with the weapon. Because there was fighting that went on all night long until the MP showed up like three or four o'clock in the morning. So they were just fighting all over the compound. Upon arriving in Vietnam, uh, what did you think of the in indigenous population? Did you have much contact with them? You know, we didn't have a, didn't have direct contact with them because I flew missions that were flew. We used to fly everywhere from Quinyan up along the Cambodian border, Laos border, uh, Central Highlands quite a bit, and then uh, I forget the name of the the town now, but it was up, not close to the EMZ, but the 173rd Airborne was up there. Uh, and over Quignon, which was one of the bigger cities, we never landed in the city and walked around in the city, but we saw it from, from the air. And what I remember is houses being built out of uh, corrugated steel, the roofs especially. And then we'd fly out through the Central Highlands, and we call them mountain yards. They were, I guess, equivalent to our Indian, I guess. <clears throat> and they were, I don't know if they were nomad type people or not, but I remember their houses being built on kind of like stilts. And then they used to like to build the side of the house out of sea ration boxes because the, the boxes are they're waterproof, they're, they're coated with like a wax. And then the roof was straw. <clears throat> uh, and they were, from what we knew, I mean, they seemed friendly. I mean, we never, you know, we landed on the ground sometimes, but we'd, we weren't allowed to go out and mix in, you know, with the people and stuff like that. So we never really got up close to them. Uh -huh. What about the rest of the troops uh, uh, that were maybe, that would go to uh, uh, Saigon or, you know, what, what was the interaction between just Geo's troops in general with the population? Or well, what about, like, how about women? What was the interaction with the women? Well, uh, where I, where we knew the women, because we used to have civilian contractors on, on the base. Some worked in the kitchen. Uh, we used to have, we used to call them hooch maids. They were mostly young gals, probably 18, 20 years old. They would come in and they would do the laundry, they would make the beds and stuff like that, um, iron your uniforms and things like that. So we got to know them uh, on a you know, little bit more personal basis. Uh, and they say, I mean, they seem nice, you know, it depends on what your duty was. Since I was gone most of the day, we used to run into them if I was off that day. But we used to talk to them. Some of them spoke fairly decent English. You could talk with them a little bit. Uh, but, I mean, uh, as far as I can tell, most people got along with them. Uh, what, was a, what was a typical day like for you in Vietnam from sun up to sundown? Uh, usually got up early in the morning, uh, 5.30, 6 o'clock. 
uh, we would get our mission orders. The company that I was in, we were kind of like a taxi company. Uh, we would have uh, somebody call. Uh, we used to work with uh, the uh, South Vietnamese Army, the, the Arvins. We flew with Koreans and then we flew with American troops. So well, the mission would be there would they'd call up and they need to move uh, 200 guys uh, on a mission somewhere. Sometimes it'd be a, a particular mission or a training mission, and we would report to the flight line, uh, report to the officer of the, of the helicopter, and for the most part we had an American uh, aircraft commander and then we had a Vietnamese co-pilot. So our job was to train the Vietnamese for combat flying. <clears throat> so. A lot of missions dealt with Vietnamese, a lot of them were training missions, and we'd fly all over, all over Vietnam, uh, some were combat. Uh, I remember when I first got there, the uh, crew chief uh, would tell me that if the Vietnamese didn't get out of the helicopter, the Vietnamese soldiers, d to throw them out of the helicopter. And I, and I told him, what do you mean throw them out? He says, if we go into hot LZ, he says, they don't get out, throw them out. We had problems where what was supposed to happen <laughs> is when you, when you come down to land, the guys that get off the helicopter, they're supposed to protect the helicopter while it's on the ground and leaving. The most vulnerable part for the helicopter was when he came in to land and taken off. Um, and, and if it was a training mission, they were okay, but if it was combat, we had some troops that did not want to get out of the helicopter and we couldn't take it back with them. So you would have to physically manhandle them to get to get off the helicopter. Uh, unfortunately, we had some that tried to get back on the helicopter as you were taken off. And uh, we had some that would hang onto the skids. Uh, some grab onto the tail boom of the helicopter. Uh, and How'd that make you feel about having to push them out well I felt bad I mean I, I mean I'm sure that I'm sure they were scared I mean most of them were just I mean they were young uh, I'm sure they were scared didn't want to get out but you know I looked at it you know we, we got our mission and they got theirs and if there was firing going on the ground well, we didn't want to stay on the ground any longer I hated to leave them there because I knew they probably wouldn't make it back but uh, you know after a while it got to be routine you know if they didn't get out uh, we used to push them out. I used, you know, because I was on the right hand side. I used to kind of grab them by their pack and and help them out. The crew chief was on the other side of the helicopter. Uh, the machine guns um, on the on the left side of the helicopter, because the tail rotors on that side, they had uh, what they call a brass bag that would catch the brass and the links coming out of the machine gun, because they didn't want it to hit the tail rotors in the back, because uh, it, it would throw it out of uh, balance. So the crew chief that I had took the, the web bag off of it and made a framework that had a deflector shield where it would deflect the rounds down. So we got into a bad, a bad area. What he would do is he'd point the gun forward. If he was sitting here, the troops were sitting here, he'd point the gun this way and all the hot brass would go inside the helicopter. So he didn't have to throw them out. They would get out because the brass is hot. Um, but, in, but I mean, it's unfortunate that we had to throw these guys out of the helicopter. When you were in Vietnam, did you ever personally dis, uh, uh, were you ever, did you ever feel any discrimination from anybody? Uh, yeah. I, me, personally, no. How about other people that you knew? Well, the, you know, we, you know, we, as I mentioned earlier in the interview, uh, we had, we had a problem with, with black soldiers. Uh, you know, I never felt personally uh, against me, but I saw it with other other people. What do you what do you th what do you think might have been the source of that of that uh, of that the soldiers black soldiers being unhappy? Um, sometimes I wonder because um, maybe they 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 weren't uh, able to get college deferments. Uh, it didn't have uh, couldn't get jobs. That they were uh, drafted, and a lot of them, a lot of them were in combat. Uh, sometimes I wonder if there was some resentment towards that. 
Uh, you know, you mean it, like the fact that they had the lower echelon jobs, the grunt, the grunt. Yeah, a lot of, of yeah, country. yeah. Because I, where I was at, we didn't we didn't have any that were um, actually flying. We did have a black platoon sergeant. Um, you know, he treated me well. I got along with him. But most of the other ones, because they were in different parts of the company, I didn't, uh, I, you know, I didn't work with them. I, I didn't associate with them. We, you know, the barracks were around where we were, and we saw them in the mess halls and stuff. But, you know, the flight platoon, it was kind of a tight group of people in the flight platoon. So we worked with each other every, every day. You know, we worked on the helicopter, stuff like that. The other black soldiers were there. They worked in the mess hall and the motor pool. Uh, but we used to have problems in the, in the evenings or things like that, you know, fights going on and things like that. How did you feel about fighting against communism and the communists? Did you feel that they were a threat to the U.S.? Well, I, I didn't feel I didn't feel they were a threat to the United States, you know, our homeland. But that they were taking over other parts of the world, you know, they, you know, Red China, and now they're going into Vietnam, and that's what they were. Uh, propaganda was from the military that we're there to fight communist aggression. What did the military tell you about about fighting communism? Um, you know, it, you know, I told you it's a different way of life, and you know, the U.S. is here to promote democracy and things like that. And and now China was, uh, well, the Soviet Union was supporting China, and China was, you know, the mainland into Vietnam. So that's where a lot of the weaponry and stuff are coming through, AK-47s, things like that. Uh, but I didn't have a real um, a political type, uh, you know, real strong feeling that we have to defeat communism, things like that. But that was your reason for being there. <clears throat> yeah. Well, reason. And you were okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where were you when the Tet Offensive happened? Well, that was in 1968. I was here in the United States, so. Do you do you remember that? Yeah, I remember somewhat about it that was going on. I wasn't there. But you I, didn't, you didn't, you didn't have any feelings strong it, one way or the other. No, no, it, and not too much because the Tet, uh, the Tet Offensive that that was the major push. Uh, what I remember more was the the My Lai massacre. Tell me about that. What what uh, what were you when this happened? Well, and that How happened. That, make you feel? that happened in '68, uh, and I didn't know too much about it until William Calley was actually convicted of his, of the war crimes, and that was in 1970 when that happened. Uh, How did that make you feel? Uh, you know, at the time I didn't know exactly what had happened. I knew there was a massacre, but didn't know a lot of the details. But at that time, what happened with us is that. <clears throat> Before when we were flying, if we took fire, we we could return fire. Well, when that happened with Cali, we had to ask the officer to return fire because the officer is the one that were responsible for for the crew. <clears throat> so most of the officers, they thought it was a bunch of BS. So we'd salute them once in the morning, and then they'd tell us, uh, "You have my permission to return fire. Just tell us." Uh, so most of them were pretty good about it. You know, we'd be flying along, and we saw something. Uh, we'd tell them, you know, we'd see something over here, and they, you know, they'd say, you know, fire. Well, at most of the places where we went, <clears throat> they would kind of tell us ahead of time whether it was um, uh, a free fire zone versus uh, an area where there might be friendlies. Uh, and there was areas that we used to go, especially up around. Um, well, the 107th Airborne was stationed. We used to go up there and support some of their stuff. We would land. Um, I mean, every time we went in and out of the base, we'd always get pot shots at us from snipers or whatever. But we weren't allowed to return fire uh, because it, it wasn't a declared enemy area. There was friend friendlies in the area. So what we would do is <laughs> we'd go to the flight line and we'd pick up rocks. And we'd put them on the floor of the helicopter. So if we flew over the village and somebody shot at us, we'd just kick a rock out. And we we couldn't we we didn't have authority to shoot at them. So we thought that was kind of BS. You know, we we looked at it that we're in a war zone and you can't you can't fire back. Uh, so other than uh, stopping the spread of communism, uh, 
Was there any other reason that you can think of that the U.S. was involved in? Uh, in well, we were there to support the French government, you know, because they got wiped out there in, in uh, the Yonkei Pass. Uh, we knew that that uh, was one of the reasons the U.S. got involved there. Uh, but again, it was still against communist aggression. Uh, what about your leaders when you were in Vietnam? Did you feel secure? Did you feel like uh, your leaders were good leaders and they were leading you in, in the... In the uh, and uh, did you feel secure, you know, under their leadership? Well, I guess never really thought about that. You know, the the leadership I can that I looked at was our direct sergeants and and captains and stuff that you know, company commander that we worked with. As far as Westmoreland, you know, leading us in the war, <clears throat> I really felt that you know we had to obey orders, and, you know, no matter what they were. Uh, so I never really questioned whether they were making the right decisions or not. Uh, I mean, I felt that was kind of out of my hands, and my job was to perform the duty that they, you know, what the mission was. Were you ever wounded in, in Vietnam? No, I was lucky. What awards or citations or commendations did you receive when you were there? Well, I have the standard, you know, the Vietnam Campaign Medal and uh, stuff like that. I have... Uh, Two uh, two air medals, one with a V device. Uh, you get one air medal for every 25 hours of combat flying that you're involved in. Uh, and I got those real early in in Vietnam. I got there in December, and I got my first uh, air medal with probably like <laughs> three weeks, which was a lot of a lot of missions. And then towards the end of it, uh, we flew missions, but we, we didn't. It wasn't combat. You had, to, you, had to, you had to engage the enemy in order to uh, count as a, a hostile action. Approximately how many of those did you <coughs> buy? Uh, Fifty, maybe. Fifty? Mm -hmm. Not many. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the anti-war movement that back in the States. I mean, you're in... You're in Vietnam. Obviously, you, you're, you're still getting news or uh, news back home. Or maybe you watch the TV or people write to you or uh, tell you stuff. How did you feel about the, uh, the anti-war demonstrations that were going on back in the States? Well, I kind of thought it was, a, first of all, it was unpatriotic. Um, some were draft dodgers and didn't want to go. You know, their reasons were political. And I don't know if, if I felt that those were uh, I don't know. It was my my tor some sort of resentment because uh, a lot of these were uh, they escaped the draft because they were able to get college deferments, uh, so they didn't they didn't go with either. You know, their parents had money, or they they got uh, scholarships somehow in order to attend college, or other people, uh, mostly minorities, didn't have the funds to to go to college to do things like that. Uh, and then the, you know, then there was the, the draft dodgers, the ones that took off to Canada, places like that. And then and at that time, I looked at it, maybe not so much that they that they were cowards, but that it was unpatriotic. That it, you know, our our you know, commander in chief asked us to be there, and it was our duty to go support it, and they weren't willing to do that. Did any of your family members <coughs> participate in the demonstrations? Not that I know of. There were, mm. there were also during that time those Chicano, Chicano movement the demonstrations mm. against the war. How did, did that make any difference to you, the fact that Chicanos were also demonstrating against the war? You know, and I, I don't think it is because I, was, I wasn't directly involved with some of that stuff. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't have a circle of friends that were involved with that. Do you think the media may have uh, may have uh, helped fuel the anti-war sentiment? Yeah, and, and I don't I don't think they did it on uh, purpose. But um, I remember we used to we used to pick up reporters. Uh, you know, we'd we'd go to a base and we'd pick these guys up, and then we'd we'd just fly around. You know, I mean, we as a crew member didn't know, you know, where we we're supposed to fly. The pilot knew where we were. We just very just long for the ride, um, and what we'd see, you know, they they would film what was going on, 
Well, then, you know, 5 o'clock news, that stuff would show up. Uh, so I think because of some of the stuff they filmed and they showed uh, some civilian casualties and, and things like that, then, of course, there was the body count all the time. Yeah. Um, I think that kind of led to some of the resentment. And then uh, I think the, from history that I've learned, when the My Lai Massacre came out, that the American public was just shocked that American troops would actually massacre a village on somebody's orders, uh, even though I'm sure that stuff happened in World War II. I mean, Korea, there's always civilian casualties. Uh, but it wasn't as widely publicized. Uh, I'm sure Korea had the same thing, but it wasn't, you know, right at your face and, you know, five o'clock dinner time and all this stuff was coming up and, you know, millions of people got to see that. So that's <clears throat> more based on the, the technological advances of the media and how they were able to yeah. film and then file it and have it on the news within an hour or two. And yeah. Do you think in that respect that the, that the media was more of a hindrance or a help in terms of the war? Probably a hindrance, as we look back in history. Uh, you know, during World War II, I mean, you didn't have, at least I don't know, you know, you didn't have civilian reporters and civilian contractors and all that stuff that were involved in the war. It was, it was, it was the military. A lot of that stuff was being censored. Well, as we started working with more and more contractors, I was surprised to see how many civilian contractors were in Vietnam, uh, you know, and they were allowed to go wherever they wanted. So, um, and I'm sure they had reporters from all over the place that were involved in the war where there wasn't any, um, uh, you know, tight control over some of that stuff. Uh, you, so you, total, how long were you in Vietnam? I was there for 12 months. I went in de December of 1970 and came back in December. The, at that time, the tour was 13 months. So you did one oh, tour? I did one tour. And, were, and were you, you said you were able to come home once during that time? No. No. Mm -mm. You were there for, you were yeah, there for 12 were there, months? Yeah the, yeah, the only time, as far as I know, they didn't allow you to, to come home on leave, but they did have what they called R&R, &R, uh, rest and relaxation. The single soldiers, I think they could go to Australia. Uh, I went to Taiwan. Uh, they used to allow. So you were in Vietnam for 12 months. Do you? Uh, how did it happen when they tell you you're going home? Do they just come into the barracks and say, uh, "Torres, your your time's up. You're going home." Or do well, you know well, what they did? You know, we're talking about the uh, the R and R. Um, uh, they had recess and, re and uh, relaxation. What it stood for. Uh, at that time, you could go to the single guys could go to various countries. They cut out Tokyo because there was too much too many drugs going on in Tokyo. The guys that were married, they could meet their wives in uh, uh, Hawaii. Uh, the wife had to get to to the west coast, and then the army would or the military would take care of you after that. Um, so you didn't. I mean, you couldn't leave Vietnam and, unless there was um, uh, an emergency of some type. But uh, the normal tour was was uh, 13 months. I got out one month early because when when I was getting out there trying to turn the country over to to Vietnamese, I called to Vietnamization. Uh, but I I stayed there for 12 months. So that was uh, a happy day, obviously. When you uh, yeah, and 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 you know what your days are. I mean, you get you get orders for it, uh, like a couple weeks before you get uh, travel orders and stuff like that. So you know what day you're you're leaving. I mean, the guys would count, you knew by the days, they would count, count them the down, days. they would count the days down, yeah. They'd call it getting short. So you, uh, what, you get on an airplane and... and yeah, and when I, yeah, when I, when I transferred down, I, I went from a uh, uh, little air base, it's called Lang Air Base outside of Quignon, and I got on a helicopter flight and flew down to the train. Uh, stayed there, and my buddy Gary that I'd met, I, I spent one night there with him, and then from there I went to Cameron Bay. And waited for the for the plane there. And you went, went through to San Francisco. Well, uh, I don't know exactly the exact route. Uh, I I do remember that <laughs> you had to take your uh, your analysis test before you leave Vietnam because there was there were so many drugs at the time. So my buddy and I were together. Well, for some reason he didn't pass the test. Uh, so I knew he wasn't on drugs or anything. But 
Uh, so we got kind of separated. But I remember as I was waiting for the flight, the, uh, the runway got mortared. Uh, so the plane had to leave. And it was a Pan Am uh, civilian flight. So when it came back, I don't know, three, four hours later, I think we landed in Guam or maybe the Philippines. I, I don't remember where it was. And then from there, we went to Fort Lewis, Washington. Is that where the guy asked you in the in restaurant the if, you, mm -hmm. if your medals were for killing children? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so you're, you're in stateside, Washington. How, do you, how were you treated by the community and, uh, and your family when you got back home to Denver? Well, the family treated me good. You know, they're happy to see me back. Um, where, I, <laughs> where I had some differences was the friends. You know, I'd run into them at a party or something like that, and uh, you know, when they would ask where I'd been, I'd, you know, I tell them I went to Vietnam. Well, the ones that I guess they were in college, they were involved in some of these movements and stuff like that. You know, right away they start rising. You know, why are you there and all this kind of stuff. It didn't matter that you know that you were drafted and it's part of your part of your obligation to serve your country. That didn't, that didn't seem to matter to them. Uh, so after a while, I just didn't even, I mean, didn't even mention it at all. Because uh, it, it just, I, it didn't feel, um, I guess it didn't, uh, didn't feel accepted by the public that what you, the duty that you're asked to, to perform, that it, that it wasn't honorable. Because uh, it was such a, uh, and I war effort going on at the time. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't supported by the American public, and that just, you know, it didn't make you feel proud of what you did. You know. Do you feel like that the government took care of its of its people, its troops in Vietnam? Yeah, I think for the most part. Uh, how about to, how about today? I think the government's taking care of its Vietnam veterans today. Well, I, yeah, I think today they are. Uh, it's unfortunate that um, it took uh, decades <laughs> yeah. for the Vietnam veteran to feel like he's been welcome home and, and appreciated for his duty. Do you feel that, that that's finally happened or it's still happening? I, I think it's getting, it's, uh, I think it's a work in progress. I mean, it's a lot better now. Uh, I know when we first went to um, a storm in Iraq, there was a little bit of uh, envy, maybe. Where we're in Vietnam, we're losing thousands a day. Uh, not that it's become commonplace, but I mean, it was in the news every day. When we first went to Roar in Iraq and some other places, you know, you, you mostly hear about a pilot getting shot down or something. Uh, and right away, it was headline news. And. I don't remember being like that in Vietnam. I mean, there were so many people getting shot down that it just kind of came commonplace. But after a while, I, I began to realize that it's, it's nice that the American public supported the troops that are there. And now, um, you know, now that I'm proud to wear my Vietnam hat and stuff like that, uh, that people actually come up to you and talk to you. You know, uh, I just, I went to, um, a new school being opened up in Aurora, and there was some active soldiers that were there, and I, I wore my Vietnam hat. Someone came up, shook my hand, you know, thanks for serving. Uh, one guy, I walked into a classroom, they were there, and the guy comes up and he says, where'd you serve? And we start talking, he was a Vietnam vet also. So it's a lot more accepted now, people are willing to talk about it. It's better. Yeah, and now uh, you feel like people, people appreciate it. Uh, you know, now, I'm proud to say that I served my country. Was it difficult to adjust afterwards when you got home? Was, was did you have any adjustment problems getting back into? Mm, not not really, not too much. I I remember I had to be careful around the house. Uh, you know, in Vietnam, we used to just cussing. You know, every other word was, was cussing. So I caught myself talking that with my mom once in a while. <laughs> so I had to. <laughs> And anyway, I can't talk that way at home anymore. Uh, but I don't. I don't think I had any real adjustments other than once I got 
used to not mention anything to you know some of the people. Um, you know, some of my buddies were supportive of what I did, and other ones, you know, wanted to sit there and argue with you. But I, I felt I adjusted pretty good. I didn't have any uh, back of flashes, you know, things like that. Uh, Do you, um, if you had to just say overall, what would, how did the Vietnam experience, how did that affect your life overall? <laughs> Well, I, th I think it showed that uh, you have to learn to be uh, somewhat uh, accepting of everybody's uh, attitudes. You know, there's people that support, you know, different issues and don't have to be war or whatever. And you have to be open that people have their opinions and, and they have their right to do that. You know, some, uh, some go about it diplomatically and <laughs> other ones are hostile about it. You know, I think it depends on that person's uh, life, you know, where their life has taken them, uh, you know, whether it was college or home life or whatever it is. Um, you know, I have friends now that, I mean, are very bitter about being in the service. Uh, Vietnam, uh, you know, unfortunately some were injured, uh, some were disabled, some were bitter about that. Uh, I was lucky that I came back, you know, one piece. You know, didn't get uh, injured, and mentally, I think I'm okay. What'd you do after the war? Where'd you go to work? I came back, and I uh, had a couple of odd jobs. Uh, worked for uh, Otis Elevator Company for a little while, um, and I think <laughs> I I remember I was working there, and uh, first they asked me to be the representative for the affirmative action program. That's when I came back. And I didn't feel that I got hired that way from that company. So I, I told them I didn't want to go to their, their meeting. Then, then they approached me after I'd been there about six, eight months. They wanted me to use my GI Bill to go to their elevator school, uh, learn electronics, uh, controlling elevators. And I thought, well, this is your company. I thought, you know, this is my GI Bill. And I didn't want to spend it for their company. I thought, well, you should pay for that. So when I told the guy, well, I'm not sure if I want to make this my career, <laughs> and I got laid off after a while. <laughs> yeah. Honesty, huh? Yeah. So I thought, well, you know, I didn't, you know, I, I just came back and it was just a job. You know, I wasn't looking at it as a career. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I decided to get married, and I got a postcard in the mail, and it was from a veterans outreach program. I didn't know then that the GI Forum was part of that. So I went down and, and applied and uh, went down for some interviews. There was three jobs. One for, was for um, U.S. West at the time. Uh, it was a lineman. One was for um, USGS and it was a uh, uh, fruit and vegetable inspector. And then one of them was, was IBM. Uh, so I, I remember the, the interview, the guy was telling me about all these different jobs. So he set up interviews for all of them, uh, and then uh, the IBM job, I thought it was a salesman, and the guy said, well, I don't talk about salesman, I just asked if he can carry a service case. So I went down and applied for that, and luckily I, I got hired on at IBM. Uh, and what was interesting is that even though when I started the training, these other, I told uh, the instructor about these other jobs, and they allowed me to go take interviews of those other jobs while I was employed with IBM. Do um, you think that was because of your Vietnam service? Or? Yeah, at that time IBM was looking for, because of affirmative action, uh, they, were, uh, they were looking for veterans and they were also looking for Hispanic. And I happened to fit in both, both parts. Luckily I knew enough about uh, electricity and electronics and mechanics that I passed the test and was hired. So you went to work at IBM when you lasted there for? Yeah, I worked for 30 years. Uh, retired. So that was your career. That was my career. That became my career. Mm -hmm. Did you join any organizations after the war? LULAC, GI Forum, VFW? No, you, know, I, you know, I didn't. I knew about the VFWs, American Legions. Uh, a buddy of mine asked me to join the American Legion. And for whatever reason, I just didn't feel comfortable there. Uh, and, and I know, and, and I don't know if part of it was because uh, in the early parts of uh, Vietnam, uh, the American Legion didn't 
recognize Vietnam as a war. So to join the VFW, you had to be a veteran of a foreign war. And they, and they didn't recognize Vietnam as a war. So they weren't accepting Vietnam veterans as a member. I didn't know that. So I think that was one of my turnoffs. Um, so I, I never had interest in, in joining the VFW. It wasn't until later on. I, I mean, I didn't even know about the American Jet Forum, about that. Uh, until I ran into a couple of friends and they invited me to some of the functions and I eventually joined the, the GI Forum. Do you think the war, the Vietnam War, had a, a special effect on Latinos, or did it? Uh, do you, Do you think that Vietnam affected Latinos differently than any other race? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I know that uh, not only Latinos, but uh, minorities. Mm -hmm. uh, minorities are generally the ones that uh, serve in the most numbers and it's probably economic. Uh, sometimes you can't find jobs. Uh, in the times of like Vietnam when they drafted, uh, a lot of the minorities didn't have the means to, uh, to go to college and get a deferment. Uh, but I, from what I've seen, I think the, the Hispanic community um, looked at it as an honor to serve their country. Uh, I would like to say we were all brave. Uh, you know, I saw some guys that were, were not uh, brave. Uh, you know, I saw the Vietnamese. I mean, we were, we were fighting for them, but yet they weren't willing to engage in battle sometimes. Uh, at the time, you know, I, I kind of looked at them well, they were kind of a coward. But now I look at it and say, well, I, wanna, I wouldn't want to send my son to battle. Uh, do you feel that movies or TV or the books since then, do you think they accurately uh, portray the uh, representation of Latinos in Vietnam? No, I don't think so. You know, that, you know, I think some of the, I'm not going to say the movies, but the, some of the producers, I think some of those are personal feelings, but I think in you know, it's Hollywood that's making movies. They were there to to make ticket sales. So, you know, they were looked at, you know, big name actors, you know, who's gonna bring in a draw? Mm -hmm. And prior to time, a draw that had, you know, featured uh, Hispanics or blacks or whatever, they didn't look at that because it was, you know, it was just business. Uh, you know, that, that wasn't a draw at the time, but now uh, economic times have changed, you know, the population has changed. Now I think people are, um, you know, when you really get down to it, they're still looking for the dollar. So they're going to see, well, who's going to buy movie tickets? Uh, although there are some producers that care more about the historical accuracy of, uh, of what happened, you know, you know, like you know, the wind talkers and things like that. I mean, you still had big name actors in that, but it's a shame that here we had some guys that contributed to World War II. Um, that weren't able to talk about their experiences. Uh, you know, they were uh, banned or, uh, you know, they were asked, they couldn't say anything about their experiences. And it's a shame that, you know, these people contributed to the war effort and helped win. And, and uh, uh, I, I know that you're the, uh, the uh, chapter commander of the Mile High American GI Forum, and I recall that Last year, a couple of years ago, Ken Burns' uh, documentary had, that had, for all intents and purposes, completely ignored the contributions or the service mm -hmm. of Hispanics in uh, World War II. Uh, is that the kind of thing that, that you're talking about in terms of rep misrepresentation yeah. or yeah. under certainly underrepresentation? Right. Yeah. You know, Ken Burns was touting that the movie, you know, they're going to use it for. Uh, uh, educational purposes, it'd be distributed to the schools free, and all that type of stuff. And as I look back, you know, learning world history and, and things like that, uh, there was never any mention about the contributions of, of really any race. It was just kind of broad overview. But the stories you did read, it was it was most, mostly white. John it, Wayne. Yeah, John Wayne and, you know, Audie Murphy and, you know, people like that. That's what we remember, you know, uh, 
uh, you know, Charles Bronson, you know, all these people. You never saw, uh, you know, Ricardo Montalban or anybody like that. And uh, Ken Burns, um, uh, you know, we went to DU and, and participated in the debates over there. Well, one of the things that I talked about is that the media is changing. Uh, you know, kids today are not learning things from books. It's movies, documentaries, the History Channel, uh, things like that. Uh, that there was no mention in it. Uh, you know, I, I recall I didn't learn about the Tahitsky Airmen. I'd never even heard of them until I saw an HBO special. You know, and if I hadn't seen that, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have seen that in the history book somewhere. Who, you, the, the Tuskegee Airmen? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, that was an HBO special. I had never heard of them before, and there was no, I'd never had any mention of them, and I was afraid that in the Ken Burns documentary, was, there was very little representation of blacks, uh, Indian or Hispanic, and that was left out, and that's a very crucial part of the war. From your own life experience, is there, is there something about the war or story that hasn't been told, uh, and or hasn't been told accurately? You think there's something? Do you think there's something else that the media or the movie producers should should portray and, and hasn't been portrayed or portrayed accurately? You mean like, for example, the 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 the, uh, the contributions of Hispanic Americans in those wars? Do you feel that those have been accurately portrayed, or has it been just kind of glossed over? A little I think bit? I think it's been kind of glossed over, and I, you know, and you take a look at now that you know some of the some of the blacks and the wind talkers are being uh, portrayed that way. But I think, uh, especially the blacks, I mean, they were very segregated. Uh, you know, there was uh, companies and battalions of, of none but black. Uh, you know, in the Hispanics, it, it wasn't that way. I mean, they kind of mixed in a little bit. Was too, I mean, we're considered Caucasian, uh, even though some uh, spoke Spanish. Uh, most of them, I think, at the time, well, spoke English, so they kind of they kind of mixed in a little bit, but yet I don't think there was ever focus that, uh, you know, we there are more Men of Honor Hispanic winners than, than any other uh, any other race. Uh, how do you how do you think your experience or the Vietnam experience is different from World War Two or Korea? Um. I think probably because uh, we were involved more with um, not a regular army that we're fighting. We were fighting the Viet Cong. Uh, you know, there was the NVA, uh, but a lot of it was the Viet Cong. So I think it, it was an eye opener for the U.S. You mean by Viet Cong? You mean guerrilla? Yeah, the guerrilla, the guerrilla type. Yeah, where uh, during the day he was a farmer, and at night he was uh, he was an enemy. Citizen soldiers. Yeah, citizen soldiers. So you couldn't tell them apart. Uh, World War II, most of them wore uniforms. I mean, there was some resistance in in uh, uh, in France and Italy and stuff like that. Uh, but for the most part, they they wore uniforms. And if there was a battle and they uh, they surrendered, uh, they there was the, the structure and the command. You know that when they come to commander. You know, surrendered. The the rest of them went with them. Well, that's not like that's not like that in Vietnam or Iraq. I mean, here we're targeting, taking out the, the you know the main leader guys, but there's somebody else who is willing to take up arms, and their their thinking is different. Uh, uh, what advice would you give to future Latinos who may be listening or who may who are going to see this interview? Well, hopefully, I think I would hope that they take advantage of education <laughs> and educate themselves. Where, if there is a war, and uh, I'm sure the Latino population is more than proud to serve. You know, I think we all love this country. Uh, but I would hope that um, uh, if you do go on the service, that you could get the uh, uh, jobs that you could do something with when you get out of the service. Uh, and not just be uh, not just be a grunt and and fall uh, into the way that you're in harm. Um, you know we do need ground troops for every war there is, and there's always casualties. Uh, but you would hope that we'd look past the war and you look when you get out of the service 
that, you're going to have a skill that you can do something with. Uh, rather than just carrying a rifle or driving a tank or something, uh, you know, that you come out and you have some type of uh, training, some education. Yeah. Well, Ernie, I want, to, I want to thank you for taking the time to do the interview. I want to thank you for your uh, patriotism, for your service, for your sacrifice. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to add before we, before we, uh, before we end up here? Mm, no, I think we're fine. In that case, thank you very much. Thank you.